Welcome. talk shows welcome to the open university of the airwaves with george galloway millions of people are on the march in pakistan in peshawar in karachi in lahore and now they are preparing to march on islamabad to overthrow the foreign imported government the installed government which overthrew the legitimate prime minister imran khan and installed the front page of the Police Gazette. 24 out of 34 of the ministers of the new federal government of Pakistan are actually on bail on a sundry list of criminal charges. And we are moments away from knowing the outcome of the French presidential election. If it goes one way, the world turns upside down. If it narrowly goes the other way, then all eyes are on the parliamentary election in France in just one month from now. And Gonzalo Lira is alive. 
and I hope also well. I don't know how free he is to speak, but he will be speaking to you in the course of the show this evening. And we'll hear from the redoubtable Caleb Mopan from the streets of New York City, telling us how it's all going down in the United States of America. I'm hearing in my ear that Macron has won, but I don't know by what percentage. 58% Macron has won according to the exit polls, according to the actually rather more scientific than exit polls, but we'll get a deeper dive into that. What does it all mean? Well, you're about to find out over the next three hours, because this is the mother of all talk shows. Curious about our curriculum? Have something to say? Then call us now to join the debate on the mother of all talk shows. The only education you can get for free. George Galloway. The mother of all talk shows. With George Galloway. The world is our classroom. And you're welcome to sit in and join the seminar. Join the seminar and join an audience last week of 1.75 million people. Not just the largest audience we've ever had, but the largest audience of any comparable show in the entire English-speaking world. A truly global, open university of the airwaves. But I must attend to some housekeeping before getting on with the show. The, we have no sponsor. I'm negotiating uh, for one with several interested parties. When we get one, I won't have to go through this rigmarole with you again. Uh, but until then, I do. If we're going to keep this open university of the airwaves open, you have to make a donation, not a big one. And if you've already made a big one, please take a holiday. I don't want to try your patience. Uh, but if you are one of the hundreds of thousands of people who haven't made any donation at all, then you're going to have to, or you're taking a free ride at everyone else's expense. It's extremely easy to make a donation of just one dollar, just one pound. It's not the price of a cup of tea in an insalubrious cafe. So please do so. The details are coming up on the screen now. From next week, you'll be able to text your donation in from the United States and from Great Britain, which will make it even easier. And then there will be no remaining excuse for not paying your way. We very much hope to be joined in the course of the show uh, by the genuine elected Prime Minister of Pakistan, Captain, my Captain Imran Khan, a personal hero to millions, tens of millions of people, not just in his own country either, to cricket lovers and to lovers of honest politicians. Because whatever else you could say about Imran Khan, you'd have to admit that he was as honest as his rivals are rotten to the core. And that's one of the issues that I want to discuss with him. We haven't yet made contact with him this evening, so Mr. Babar, who arranged this, if you are watching, please, we need your Zoom or your, uh, your uh, address that we can connect to so that uh, Imran Khan, the Prime Minister, can be on screen for as long or as short as he wishes to be. I appreciate that uh, there are many demands on his time. He can come on for five minutes or he can come on for 55 minutes but we will need to make electronic connection for that to happen. But while we wait for Imran Khan, let me set out my stall on events in Pakistan. I'm not doing and saying what I am doing and saying uh, for the PTI, Mr. Khan's party. I'm not even actually doing it for Mr. Khan, much as I admire him. I'm doing it for Pakistan because Pakistan means a very great deal to me and has done since my involvement with the country began in the 1970s, which is not yesterday, I'm sure you will agree. For my work in the 1980s, I was decorated with Pakistan's highest civil award, the Halalik Adiyazam, 
for my work in the restoration of democracy in Pakistan. And having won that badge with pride for all these decades, I cannot remain silent when democracy is stolen by people who have a proven track record of theft. Theft on a grand scale, grand larson, the looting of the public purse and private corruption in Pakistan that would make your eyes water. As I said in my introduction, uh, the coup regime that has been installed by the Americans in Islamabad is rotten to the core. 24 out of 34 of them are on bail on a variety of corruption and money laundering charges. This is a joke, I'm sorry. There is no government in the entire world where 70% of the members of the cabinet are out on bail waiting for trial, accused of grand larceny, of malfeasance, and uh, high crimes and misdemeanors. And they include, of course, the crime minister, Shabazz Sharif, the crime minister of Pakistan, and his son are both on bail. It's a wonder they're not on an electronic tag. They would be if they were in Britain or the United States, but not in Pakistan. They couldn't even wait for the stooge courts to wipe out their charges before installing them in Prime Minister House. Shabazz Sharif is on bail for a money laundering charge that, as I say, would make your eyes water, involving hundreds of millions, hundreds of millions. His co-accused is his son, who is, of course, now the imposed chief minister of Pakistan's most populous province, the Punjab. You couldn't make this up. The proximate reason for the overthrow of Imran Khan was that he lost a rigged no-confidence motion in the Pakistan National Assembly, where overnight 20 members of his ruling party defected to the opposition. They were procured by the opposition as part of an American regime change operation. What was the reason for that regime change operation? It's obvious, and it can be summed up in just two words. Absolutely not. When Imran Khan was asked, would Pakistan be joining uh, the Western organized sanctions and quarantine, embargo, a siege on Russia, Imran Khan said, absolutely not. These two words signed his political death warrant. But he's coming back from the dead. Of that, I am absolutely certain. Because when they overthrew him, they misunderestimated, as George W. Bush would put it, the great people of Pakistan. When Shabazz Sharif, the crime minister in prime minister's house in Islamabad right now, for the moment, said Pakistan is a nation of beggars and beggars can't be choosers, he signed his political death warrant. The people of Pakistan have arisen in a kind of revolutionary upheaval. Numbers on the streets that have never been seen before, from Peshawar to Karachi, and then the Lion of Lahore, Imran Khan, addressing a truly mammoth rally at the Red Fort in Lahore, one of my favorite cities in the whole world, in which I spent many, many, many happy hours. Imran Khan will be back because this flimsy piece of cardboard cutout government whose only support lies in Washington, not even in the European Union, not even in Britain. The Foreign Office Minister, Zach Goldsmith, deplored, decried uh, the overthrow. He was slapped down by Boris Johnson, but he wasn't sacked for doing so. The only main state for this puppet government in Islamabad at this point in time, although by the morning it could all be different, is the United States of America. And it shows just how flimsy American power in the Eurasian heartland actually is. They couldn't find anyone decent. 
They couldn't find anyone who's on a criminal charge. They couldn't find anyone who's not on bail to replace Imran Khan. They've turned back to an old guard which is utterly discredited in Pakistan and will be swept away. And I'm doing and saying all this not because I'm a PTI loyalist. I'm very far from that. I have never supported Imran Khan in the past, but I am supporting him now for Pakistan in this one singular demand. Elections now. This is the only way to solve the crisis which runs the risk of having Pakistan, a country of 220 million people, and armed with nuclear weapons and geostrategically placed in an exceedingly fragile place in the world. The only way to stop a helter-skelter all the way to hell for Pakistan is to hold a free and fair election. Now I have differences, political differences, uh, with uh, Imran Khan. One of those is his fidelity to the institutions of Pakistan that have repeatedly caused the overthrow and the coup d'etat of government after government after government in Pakistan. One of the reasons why I'm opposing this coup is because I opposed all the coups that came before it. Whoever was the beneficiary of it, I'm against having an army uh, that can overthrow governments. I'm against having an army that can tell the courts to overthrow governments. I'm against having an army that can tell the president to dismiss the prime minister. And I have said so and acted on that over decades, decades. I opposed the overthrow of Benazir Bhutto. I opposed the overthrow of Nawaz Sharif, the brother of Shabazz Sharif, and I oppose it when it's done to Imran Khan. So I'm not here asking anyone to vote for Imran Khan or for the PTI. I am, though, demanding that the Pakistani people have a right to vote, to choose their own government, and to choose it before it's too late, before the country has slipped out of control. Mr. Babar, we're still waiting on that Zoom address. If you're watching, you better hurry up because this is an opportunity of a massive audience tonight, mainly a Western audience, uh, to which Imran Khan can make his case. We've got a poll running. Will Imran Khan return as Pakistan Prime Minister? A, yes. B, no. That is the poll, and I'm told it's gone off like the proverbial rocket. Now, let me turn to France. Just in the last minute, I've uh, learned from our editor holding up a piece of paper with Biro writing on it. I hope I read it correctly. My eyesight's not what it was, but it seemed to say that Macron had won with 58% of the vote. I don't know if that's more or less than he won by last time. I suspect it is less. It's certainly nothing to write home about when your only opponent was the leader of a far-right nationalist front whose father was deeply implicated in the Vichy fascist regime, which ruled by German uh, fiat in the uh, occupied French homeland uh, from uh, 1940 to 1945. My new book's out, by the way, I'll show it to you later, which deals with the counterfactual history of that period. So it's nothing to boast about to beat a Le Pen, uh, 58, presumably to 42. And if my candidate, Jean-Luc Mélenchon, had got into the second ballot, and if the idiots of the French Communist Party and the idiots of the French Trotskyite fragments and the idiots of the so-called French Socialist Party who got less than 2% of the vote had backed Mélenchon, this choice would have been between Mélenchon and Macron and Mélenchon would have won in a landslide. Idiots, all of you, go and sit in the corner with your dancers' hats on. But Mélenchon will be leading a bloc in the French parliamentary elections just one month from now. And all the indications are that he will lead 
the biggest bloc in the French National Assembly. Prime Minister Jean-Luc Mélenchon, my friend, has a ring to it. If we get Imran Khan back in, that will be two prime ministers that are friends of mine that will be sitting in prime ministerial accommodation. I very much hope so. I don't know how that poll is going, but it's big. And it's yes, 91%. Will Imran Khan return as Pakistan prime minister? Yes, 91%. No, 9%. My goodness. And there's a record-breaking number of votes already, and it's only 17 minutes past the hour. Are you watching, Mr. Baba? 13,700 votes. No sign of Imran Khan yet. Let me turn to Gonzalo Lira. I said uh, rather sonorously uh, last Sunday that I feared for the safety and even the life of the citizen journalist Gonzalo Lira, who had disappeared on a week past Friday and had failed to show for his interview with us last Sunday. He had earlier said that if we didn't hear from him within 12 hours, we should put his name on a list of those who have been disappeared, presumed, and actually in some cases murdered uh, by the fascist hordes, the black hundreds that underpin the coup regime in Kiev. As the week went on, we became more and more convinced, looking at the exaltation of various fascist sites on Twitter and elsewhere, uh, that Gonzalo Lira had been murdered and indeed murdered in a most foul way. And I'm very glad to say that that turned out to be false because just 24 hours or so ago, after I had received anguished mail uh, from Gonzalo's father in the United States, Gonzalo turned up alive. And we are going to be speaking to him in the course of the show. Gonzalo Lira is one of uh, very few people who are actually bringing us any news at all about the war in Ukraine. The rest are bringing us propaganda from the watering holes of Kiev. They're not even venturing into the places they are reporting about. But Lira is, or rather was, on the streets of Kharkov, which is now very definitely a war zone. The battle for Kharkov has begun. And like the rest of the battles, it will only end one way. It's better, therefore, that it ends quickly and by negotiation. And the United Nations Secretary General Guterres is on the aeroplane headed for Turkey, uh, where he'll engage in talks with President Erdogan, then to Kiev to talk with President Zelensky, and then to Moscow, where he will talk with President Putin and Foreign Secretary Mr. Lavrov. I hope, I earnestly hope, uh, that a peace agreement can be reached as a result of this initiative, too little, maybe, too late, definitely, by the United Nations, who have been more or less silent throughout the five, six weeks of this conflict. I hope that peace will come. I fear that it will not, because I don't think that the administration of Joe Biden has any wish for this war to come to an end. I believe that NATO, which is just another name, for the United States of America is ready to fight to the last drop of Ukrainian blood, to see the last building in the last city in Ukraine fall to the ground in rubble. I believe, as I believe from the beginning, that this is a proxy war of the United States against the Russian Federation. In which case, I hope they were paying a good deal of attention uh, to the Russian launch of their new hypersonic intercontinental ballistic missile, nicknamed Satan-2. Uh, it carries multiple nuclear warheads and is unimpeachable, simply cannot be intercepted. It cannot be intercepted because it moves at 10 times the speed of sound. Think of Concorde and then think of 10 times faster than that. 
if launched on the Russian steppe, it would arrive in London, Birmingham, Manchester and Glasgow all at the same time, six minutes after launch. Six minutes after leaving Russian territory. And it would be the end. Britain would be a smoking ruin and almost all of us would be dead. I hope that those waving their frankly non-existent willies from London and Whitehall at the Russians are fully appraised of that. I hope that the United States is paying attention to the new Chinese space initiative, which changes the balance still further against the warmongers of NATO and in favor of the East. Well and truly, the sun is rising in the East. It didn't have to sink in the West, metaphorically speaking. We could have got alongside the rising sun in the East. We could have done business with them. Instead, we have chosen to make war against them. And it's a war that we cannot win. For the moment, for most of us, it's an economic war. It's an economic war that we cannot win either. The Russian economy has got up off the floor and is booming, and the American and British economies are heading for the floor. It is a classic case of struggling mightily to lift a huge stone only to drop it on your own feet. That's exactly what has happened. We'll be talking uh, about all of that over the course of the next uh, three and a half hours. We'll take calls uh, because there's no sign yet of Imran Khan. But here's the poll again. Will Imran Khan return as Pakistan Prime Minister? A, yes. B, no. You can vote on my Twitter account, on my YouTube channel. Do subscribe if you're there. And on my Telegram channel. And here's our numbers uh, through which you can phone us completely free. 08 081 96 That's if you're in the United Kingdom. 08 081 96 If you're in the United States, it's also free of charge. It's plus one 844 You can email the show anytime at all at onair at moats.tv. Shall I go to the first call? Now I'll take a quick break, shan't I? George, the deep state, we mentioned it before. So rather than fear-mongering that everything is going on at the moment with the COVID, the wars, blah, 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 why aren't we all addressing the deep state rather than this fear-mongering that's going over and over again? How do you address it? What I'm trying to get across, and hopefully your listeners will understand this, there is a deep state at work, and you know that. Everybody what? knows that. That's a statement of the yeah, bleeding yeah. obvious. So, oh, so let's do something about that. Rather than rushing and rolling what? about the Give Give us a lead. Be, our the be, be, be our leader. Be our leader, Dell. Who are the deep states? Yeah. Oh, what a brilliant question. Uh, those, those are all over us. And what should we do about them? We should um, make them accountable. I'm just trying to. I'm just trying to work out whether you're in the territory of shape-shifting lizards, or you're talking oh, about MI5 please. and MI6. Please don't turn into a circus, George. You know full well what's going on. And please, don't I do. Catch I do. Me. I do. I'm just struggling to get from you what it is we should be doing about them. What should I do about MI5 and MI6, and how should I do it? Just stand up and go, 
There's something inherently wrong here. And There's something that. really wrong here. There you are. I've there sorted it. Go. I've sorted it, Del. Thanks for the call. You are listening to the mother of all talk shows with George Galloway. Who knew it was as easy to sort it as that caller uh, made clear? Let me read some of the voluminous social media. Uh, Ali Nahal says, There's nothing that can stop Imran Khan returning as Prime Minister of Pakistan. That too with a thumping majority. Time will affirm that the US initiated conspiracy only proved to be a blessing in disguise for Imran Khan's government and consequently for Pakistan. I absolutely agree with that, Aline. I think a two-thirds majority is on the cards, and it will be vital to do the right thing with that two-thirds majority. Sajad Khan says Imran Khan is a sportsman. It's in his blood how to fight back. No one can undo the democracy in Pakistan, not even the USA, not even the sold-out Pakistan military. And Michelle says, I want to vote yes, but the US grubby hands are in the batter. Pakistani people may be able to overcome this. I'm hopeful. And Rafael Najendra says the dubious and hurried way of kicking Imran Khan out of office has grounded him to spring back even stronger. I agree with that, Rafael, and I'm not just saying that. Uh, it's not wishful thinking. It's my honest appraisal of the situation. Let's go to Canada for the first call. Arsene. Arsene in Canada, welcome to the mother of all talk shows. Hi, George, how are you? By the grace Hi, George, of God, good, sir. Me? Thank you. What would you like to say? Yes, the whole yeah, world can George, hear you. Go uh, on. I was, <laughs> okay. I was told that Imran Khan is about to join you, right? Is he, is he there yet? Can I talk to him? Can I ask him questions? <laughs> He's not here yet, but I'm not sure I can subject him to questions. Uh, we're still getting him up. Uh, okay. But uh, I'll ask okay, him was, uh, your what, question. If you, you ask it to me, <laughs> ask it to me. Okay, good. Okay. The first one, like he's not in power anymore, right? So because the current government uh, is because uh, I'm from Canada, right? And they are taking back our right to vote, right? For, uh, overseas Pakistan is. And secondly, what I want to ask, like if he is, uh, you know, running a campaign about this uh, imported government, why don't he uh, give resign from all the national assemblies and why don't he go nuts about it? This is my question. Well, I'm not sure the second part of that question uh, has any validity at all. Uh, why is he not going nuts about it? Well, first of all, he's not the sort of man that goes nuts. He is, on the other hand, a very steely individual uh, who is immediately focused on the task in hand, which is to mobilize the maximum number of people in Pakistan uh, to force the stooge imported government to demit office and to hold a general election. And I predict to you, you might not like my prediction, but I mean it, that before the harvest is in, there will be new elections in Pakistan. And if they are free and fair and not rigged as many elections have been in the past, uh, then Imran Khan will win a thumping majority. Uh, look, the, the current prime minister is a stinker. Shabazz Sharif is a stinker. His government are rotters. And the people of Pakistan deserve better than that. And they will have better than that. I can assure you uh, of that. Uh, will Imran Khan return as Pakistan Prime Minister? A yes, B, no. Will Imran Khan turn up soon for the show? I very much hope so. Uh, the... Le Pen has conceded in France, so Macron is uh, the uh, president for the next five years. Uh, I told you, Raphael Siddiqui says even with the whole system against him, he will come back with people's support. Imran is one of Pakistan's favorite sons, and 
Pakistanis won't leave him ever. I spoke in Manchester in Piccadilly Gardens uh, at the weekend. Um, I think it was at the weekend, earlier this week anyway. Uh, and a very spirited gathering it was too. And on the screen behind me, there were millions of people on the streets of Lahore. The bot says, hi, this is a deal. The question is whether Mr. Imran will reform the judiciary after becoming the prime minister again. This has become very necessary in view of the current situation. If reforms are not made, then this will continue to happen again and again. I mean, Adil, the very words I said earlier. And Ayo Sunt says, biggest problem for Imran Khan was infiltrators around him who play on both sides of the wicket. And they are still present around him. I'm sure he is aware of it. And I hope he makes sure that he will get rid of them as soon as possible. Well, I don't know uh, the other infiltrators, but I'm well familiar with the infiltrator that sat as the governor of the Punjab. I don't know if he's still the governor, if he's been reinstated, but I hope he's not there for long. And I did warn Imran Khan uh, years ago, in 2015, I think, uh, that he would rue the day uh, that he formed an alliance uh, with Chaudhry Mohammed Sarwar and rue it eventually. He did. And uh, Bilal Fayaz says the key factor in bringing back Imran Khan is the social media. Pakistan army establishment has never faced such a challenge before. Imran Khan has politicized the whole nation, youth, women, politics is every dinner table discussion. It's not an elite chess game anymore. That's the best text of the night, Bilal, so far, but there's a long way to go. Get voting on my Twitter, on my YouTube channel, and on my Telegram channel. In our poll, will Imran Khan return as Pakistan Prime Minister? Shall I go to Corinne in Peterborough? Corinne, always welcome. Thank you very much, George. And um, I'm really grateful that you've allowed me to come back and speak with you again. Um, I wanted to talk, and you have Gonzalo Lira on later, um, and, and I'm, I was really, um, like very many people, very sad when he didn't turn up on the show last time. And we were all very worried about him, and um, so many people... Um, decided to write to the embassies and um, world leaders and ask nicely if they could, um, you know, just find out his whereabouts. And then shortly after that, he was released and, um, well, released back to his home. Yeah, I think that may have helped, uh, Corinne. Uh, your efforts may well have helped, along with my own and many, many others. I wrote to the uh, president of Chile, I wrote to the foreign minister of Chile, I wrote to the leader of the communist bloc in the parliament in Chile, I wrote to the embassy of Chile in Poland, which was dealing with uh, Ukrainian affairs, and I know that many, many people did, and uh, thanks to God, uh, this helped. Such a good person to have done all that hard work. And I want to thank you, and I want to thank all, all the other people as well who who did that. Now, um, I have this belief that politicians um, listen to people because they politicians always like to be popular, and po politicians always like to be justified in their actions. And so, I think that the only way that well, I hope. Well, no, no. I think that the only way we can end the war in Ukraine, because it does seem to be an awful lot of the meeting and not to, you know, not getting any results. But this time, you know, let's hope there will be results. Is that we, the people, that's everybody listening, that's you, me, everybody listening, write to world leaders and especially to uh, President Biden, um, President Zelensky. Um, and President um, Vladimir Putin and our own presidents and leaders of our own thing, our own countries, and say, please, um, we care about this war and we'd like to see it end. And just just ask nicely, you know, could you help bring about talks 
peace talks um, and then say thank you. Um, anyway, that's why I phoned in. It's just, I thought, if we could do, you know, if we, if all of us could made a, a change and got we must all do our Lira, bit. we yes. could do this. Yes. Yes. And if we don't exactly. ask, we don't Faith get. Faith can move mountains and uh, God helps those that help themselves. Corinne, thanks. A terrific call from Peterborough. Ebrar is on the line, again from England, in Birmingham. Go ahead, Ebrar. Thank you very much, George. I appreciate uh, giving me some time to speak. Actually, George, we've got some history wow. across paths in the past. Uh, at the University of Birmingham, if you remember, many years ago, with the Friends of Palestine, you came in 2009, I believe, 2009-10. Uh, uh, I was with you, and I almost joined the Gaza Flotilla. So it's uh, a long time ago, but we've, we've crossed paths in the past. But today I would like to just I really remember, highlight. I remember the, I remember the meeting uh, very clearly, Ibra. <laughs> it was quite it was uh, an interesting day. Uh, quite a, a tricky, quite a tricky wicket. Indeed, I'm glad you got away with the not out. Let's just say that. <laughs> so, George, what it exactly. is? Exactly. Go ahead, Ibra. I've come back to university after eight years. I'm doing a PhD at the moment. And so naturally I've become re-embroiled within the students. And um, so as I'm a slightly mature student, uh, two weeks ago when Imran Khan called on people to come together, we in Birmingham and the Midlands felt actually we couldn't sit back, even though we, we were comfortable in one way, uh, we're able to enjoy a good life in the UK. Thanks to the UK government for giving us many um, freedoms. Um, but we as British Pakistanis and young people felt we needed to take a stand. So we set up something um, called the Pakistan Student Alliance in solidarity with our brothers and sisters in Pakistan, um, mainly in support of Imran Khan, but actually more in support of good governance and focusing on those kind of ideals like equality and justice because we feel actually it's not a case of saying party a is bad or party b is bad people can see that but it's more a case of empowering the young people educating the young people so that actually the message that imran khan wants to portray gets across which is the key thing i think so we had a problem i agree today, with you which was entirely first. uh this is about yeah, go on. Sorry, just to uh, get to my point. Today we, we held our very first uh, protest, a Midlands Pakistan Student Alliance protest, which actually is the first of its kind for any Pakistani students in the UK. And so we just wanted to come onto your show and to say, you know, we young people and we British people understand what's happening abroad. We can see corruption when it's black and white in front of you. Um, we can see what good governance looks like coming from the West. And actually, we know what fairness and equality is. So please don't put someone in front of us as a new okay, leader I, like Shabazz Sharif. I, 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 I promise you, yeah, I, I promise you I will uh, convey that to Prime Minister Imran Khan when he finally joins us. Uh, and well done for that activity. I myself will be speaking in Birmingham soon. Uh, I'm speaking in Oxford on uh, Monday, uh, but I hope uh, a public meeting is now being organized in Birmingham, in the, in the whole green uh, part of Birmingham. Uh, and so I'm, I might meet you there, Ibra, if you are free, do come along and make yourself known uh, to me. Uh, the uh, issue of good governance is at the heart of it. Uh, Pakistan uh, has had good governance under Imran Khan, certainly by comparison uh, with the rogues gallery that went before. And that rogues gallery is now back. As I said, the cabinet looks like the front page of the Police Gazette. It's like a wanted poster. Instead, it's a poster of the government of Pakistan. And no free people will put up with that. Pakistanis are not beggars. Uh, they are not slaves. Uh, they are a hard-working and intelligent people who have now the taste for democracy and they will not allow it to be stolen from them. Of that, I am 
very sure indeed. And it looks like on the poll uh, that uh, overwhelmingly people agree with me. The previous uh, record uh, votes on one of our polls was 10,000. This one so far has 33,500 votes. Will Imran Khan return as Pakistan Prime Minister? A, yes, 95%, that's on Twitter. Yes, 95% on YouTube. And on Telegram, yes, 83%. A little more skeptical on the Telegram channel. Uh, no, 5% on Twitter. No, 5% on YouTube. No, 17% on Telegram. If you're one of those that voted no uh, on Telegram or anywhere else, do call the show because I'd like you to hear your reasoning. If you are in the United Kingdom, it's 08081 9655522. If you're in the United States, it's plus one eight four four nine four four double three double four. You can email the show anytime at onair at moats dot. TV. I'll keep on taking calls, but I may have to cut callers off quickly if a certain Imran Khan comes on the line. I'm sure you'll understand. Hussein is in Italy. Go ahead, Hussein. Hello, George. Uh, first of all, uh, I want to say that I'm a huge fan of yours. been following uh, your uh, shows and thank talks you, uh, for a long time. And thank, uh, you, thank you for the opportunity. This is actually my first time calling on uh, on any uh, TV show or or, or live to to a live uh, audience. Okay. So first of Just all, take your time. Um, then. Take your time. Yeah, sure. Yeah. All right. So we here uh, in Italy, uh, my family, we have uh, been supporting Imran Khan for uh, uh, since 2010 or so since he became a little bit uh, uh, more apparent on the on the Pakistani politics. And uh, let me tell you, I've seen a lot, a lot, and a lot of people converting from other corrupt parties to, to Imran Khan for guidance. And uh, we are saddened uh, for what has happened in Pakistan in the, in the last month or so. The way the courts uh, were open at 12 at the night, and, uh, and, and the way all the institutions have turned against Imran Khan, it has saddened all us, uh, uh, us Pakistanis living abroad. And uh, I just want to convey this message that we stand with Imran Khan all the way, and uh, we will support him till the end, till he comes back with a two-third majority, and for, for, uh, for and bring change for, for good in Pakistan. That's, uh, that's my message to, to my Pakistan. Well, I'll tell, him, I'll, I'll tell him that message. I'll tell him that message from Italy, Hussein. Thank you for it. Very moving indeed it was. You've touched on uh, what is a, a political difference I have with Imran Khan. Uh, he, conti he continues to exalt some at least of the institutions which are in fact the fundamental problem in Pakistan. I've been involved in Pakistani politics for too long not to know and acknowledge them. And I'm going to call a spade a spade. I appreciate it's different if you're in politics in Pakistan, but you tune in here to this show to hear what I think is the truth. And what I think is the truth is that Pakistan's much vaunted institutions are rotten to the core starting with the chief of army staff. This coup could not have happened without his green light and neither any of the other coups. I've lost track of them. Uh, when I became involved in uh, Pakistani affairs, uh, Ziaul Haq had just hanged uh, the elected uh, leader of Pakistan, Zulfikar Ali Bhutto. I have been involved since then and the army have time after time after time after time negated or actually rigged the outcome of parliamentary elections. And the courts, to me, I'm sorry, are a joke. They are like a spoof, a Terry Thomas version 
of 1930s, 1940s England. We're not like that anymore. We might even be worse than that uh, now. But we're not like that anymore. And for a reason. This window dressing uh, of the rule of law, this window dressing of military subordination to the political leadership of the country is nonsense. It isn't true. And unless it's changed, then Pakistani leaders, however much support they have in the country, will continue to be disposed of. And moreover, like the Egyptian army, the top brass of the Pakistan army is bought and paid for by the United States of America. Imran Khan was disposed of just like that on a word from the United States of America. And the army wheeled into action, the chief of army staff wheeled into action. Now he takes off his uniform, uh, I think in the autumn. Uh, October or November uh, of this year. If he doesn't want to be remembered in infamy, he'll make sure that a general election is held before then. Let me take a quick break and I'll be right back. Peter says the Afghan people have lost, George. I thought you were better than this, to be honest. Give me a call, Peter. Tell me what you mean. And Oliver says, for some reason, George was on the jihadist side when it came to Yugoslavia. <laughs> and that's the reason I will never trust him. I fought against the war on Yugoslavia with all my breath and all my heart. Me and Tony Benn and Jeremy Corbyn and others we're practically the only people in this country opposing the war on Yugoslavia, the destruction of Yugoslavia. How dare you, you imbecile? If you have any guts, you'll pick up the phone right now and call this show and justify that utter slander. Really. And uh, Yoda says, love the show, best entertainment and education on the airwaves. <laughs> T-minus. Ignition. Lift off. Lift off. We need to uh, acclimatise the public uh, for the introduction of extraterrestrials because, come to the conclusion at this point, if they're going to come, they are going to come soon. Back in the late 60s and early 70s, they actually saw the softer land in front of them or pass by in New York or go overhead. It went in front of my eyes up and turned into a, what looked like a star. Way up in the sky. They said the same line that you just made, and it was amazing. It is an awful waste of space if, if we are all if that there is. If we are all that there is, exactly. Have you ever seen any of these phenomena? I have seen um, energy entities. One looked like a massive jellyfish. The other one looked like a massive centipede. <laughs> Well, you had me up to that point. Now I just think you're stark raving mad. You are listening to the mother of all talk shows with George Galloway. You're watching the mother of all talk shows and we're still waiting for Prime Minister Imran Khan. I see... Uh, that uh, uh, Mr. Shabazz from PTI has tweeted in the last few minutes uh, that there was no scheduled appointment with me this evening. Unfortunately, Dr. Shabazz, I have all the correspondence. I have the booking. Don't make me publish it. Get Imran Khan on the line, please. Uh, it'll only take him 10 minutes and it will be worth the trouble. He says that they'll rearrange something, but 
In the words of Tom Hagen, I never asked for a second interview when the first one has been declined. Uh, will Imran Khan return as Pakistan Prime Minister? A, yes. B, no. There's a tremendous number of people voting on this, Mr. Shabazz Gill. Take a look at the voting. Mahmoud is in China. Let me hear from him. Mahmoud in China, welcome. Hello, sir. It's Hi good there. to Go see ahead. you talking about uh, Imran yeah. Khan. Uh, I never imagined that he would yeah. be this much, this much famous. <laughs> Hello? Well, uh, I've known him for a very long time. He wasn't uh, politically famous when I first met him. Of course, as a sporting hero, he was enormously iconic. Uh, but he has patiently, tenaciously, with great courage, uh, built a massive political movement in Pakistan and amongst the diaspora all over the world. Uh, and you're in China, and I'm going to infer that you're a part of it. <laughs> okay, um, I just uh, wanted to say something. Um, uh, I, I, I don't know if yeah. I, I heard it wrong. You said he was removed because he said um, absolutely not on the issue of Russia. Uh, but it wasn't uh, yeah. that. It uh, it was because he said absolutely not when 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 a journalist asked him to, to if if you will uh, provide air bases to 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 USA uh, to help them with uh, Afghanistan. So he Same said thing. absolutely not. Spark, yeah, uh, yeah, he was just yeah, of course. But he also said absolutely not to the sanctions on Russia. In fact, he made a very beneficial deal for the people of Pakistan for Russian uh, gas and for Russian wheat. And the United States cannot tolerate China with close relations, super close, with China and now with Russia at the same time for the reasons of air bases, for the reasons of sanctions, for the reasons of Afghanistan and the use of Pakistan once again as a launch pad for attacks on Afghanistan is because uh, Imran said absolutely not on these things that uh, he has been uh, overthrown. Go ahead. Okay, so now my question is: uh, a lot of people in Pakistan they don't they don't believe on this um, uh, change of government that it happened. Uh, it is done uh, from uh, from USA, you know. So what do you think of this? Like, uh, do you know about the letter that he received? Uh, and stuff like that. Do you think it's true and he was removed just because of the pressure from I absolutely the think it's true. Look, uh, I, I've known uh, many coups, not just in Pakistan, but uh, I suppose more of them in Pakistan than anywhere else. I know what a coup looks like. I know what a coup smells like and sounds like. And I know what a military-backed coup looks like and smells like. And if it walks like a duck, looks like a duck and quacks like a duck, it's probably a duck. And this is a duck, a regime change ordered by the United States, executed through the chief of army staff and utilizing uh, the tools, the stooges of the discredited political parties. That's my view. Uh, before I go to Kaiser in Glasgow, Ramin Shazad, Thanks for an informative show, George. Just wanted to say one thing. As a Pakistani, I'm happy to see we're now united as a nation. Imran Khan has made us forget all our differences. This imported government underestimated the power of Pakistanis. They did not predict that we could be this strong. And it's now time to show our strength. Our response to this illegitimate regime change is loud and clear from the Lahore Jalsa. We are not beggars, and we will not accept an imported government. And Tariq Ahmad says, what's UK and EU take on the regime change? Silence was golden, Tariq. Syed says, how does Imran Khan expect to come back when almost everyone in the country, including the establishment, judiciary, and election committee, is against him? Well, everyone except all the millions on the street, uh, Syed. Let's go to Kaza in Glasgow. Go ahead, Kaza. Hi, George. How are you doing? 
Good, brother. Nice Yo, to hear you... from you. What would you like to say? Yes. Yes. Uh, yes. I'm listening to you for well number of years in this country in UK. Well, the pleasure to have talking to you right now. Right. Uh, obviously, Imran you, Khan is not there, and uh, I'll leave the message with not you. Not yet. Guess. Not yet. Yeah. That's yeah. cool. Right. If he comes in, and if is I have enough time for you to put my message through. The first message I have to say to him is, is the loud and clear is number four gate in Pakistan have to be closed. If not closed, if without Imran Khan's permission, we are going through as a public, as an innocent Pakistani, because we are all feel wounded and hurt. And, and the second one is, we are, had a big project in Pakistan, including myself, a building 500 rooms in Gilgit, Baluchistan. And I put that on hold. And I will not send, or none of my colleagues or businessmen people in this country will not send a one pound into the country until Imran Khan is back. And the third my well, I think is. that's, I mean, if I had, uh, if I had any money, Kaza, I certainly wouldn't be investing it uh, to a country uh, run by Shabazz Sharif, would you? Of course not, of course not. You know, believe me, George, we are Muslim League supporters from my dad to my granddad. My dad spent three years in a prison for Nawaz Sharif. Okay, so that's all changes. Like the, somebody just says to you, Imran Khan, bring the politics into the tables in the hotel room, into the living room. It's not a public in a politics in a parliament anymore. And we will decide, we will be the Supreme Court, we will be the High Commissioner, we will be the Election Commissioner, whoever they are. If this is not sorted, we are going through their doors without Imran Khan's permission. That's where we're standing right now. Well, that's very powerful talk, uh, Kazar. Uh, if we uh, get Imran, I'll certainly convey that to him. We don't want any violence, of course. What we want is mass political power. You know, when you can gather people in the millions, and when that becomes the tens of millions, that's a human tide that will sweep all before it. And not a blow needs to be struck. Not a window needs to be broken. I'll be back uh, for the second hour right after this break with, I hope, Prime Minister Imran Khan. Keep your fingers crossed. Voting has just closed in the French presidential election with exit polls predicting a shock result. And I can tell you that the far right Marine Le Pen has been narrowly defeated by incumbent Emmanuel Macron. French voters were faced with two very different visions for their country during Sunday's presidential runoff election as the centrist President Macron sought to fend off a challenge from Le Pen. Macron pitched a vision of a globalised France at the head of a strong European Union. Le Pen put forward an economical, nationalist, more inward-looking platform that would represent a fundamental shift from the direction France has since taken since the Second World War. This was a rematch of the 2017 contest where Macron bested Le Pen by nearly two to one. This one is predicted to be much closer. Macron's attempt at diplomacy over the war in Ukraine took him away from the campaign trail, while Le Pen was forced to backtrack on her previous support for President Vladimir Putin. 
She has long been a vocal admirer of the Russian president, even visiting him during her 2017 campaign and her t party took out a loan from a Czech Russian bank several years ago. Le Pen put herself in a strong position by focusing on costs of living issues, veering away from the typical far-right platform focused on immigration, security and identity that dominated her 2017 campaign. However, she did not abandon some of her most controversial policies, like banning Muslim women from wearing headscarves in public. Removing Prime Minister Boris Johnson from Downing Street would lead to instability and uncertainty in the country, according to the Conservative Party's chairman. The Prime Minister has come under increasing pressure from MPs after being fined by the police for attending a party in Number 10 during the first lockdown. Some senior Tories have now joined opposition calls for Prime Minister Johnson to go. Oliver Dowden said changing leader right now would not be in the national interest. The party chairman said the UK faced unparalleled challenges over national security and energy supplies and it was right for the Prime Minister to focus on that. Labour Party leader Sir Keir Starmer said the PM's authority was shot through and the so-called Partygate scandal was stopping Parliament discussing issues like the cost of living crisis. The SNP's Westminster leader Ian Blackford also said Mr Johnson now had no moral authority to lead after being fined for Covid breaking laws. Last week, Mr Johnson, along with his wife Carrie and Chancellor Rishi Sunak, were fined by police for attending a birthday party thrown in his honour in the Cabinet Room in June 2020. Labour is calling for an emergency budget in Britain to bring forward measures to tackle the costs of the living crisis. Surges in fuel, energy and food prices are hitting people's pockets, with inflation running at a 30-year high. Labour leader Sir Keir Starmer says the government's response had been woeful and demanded further measurements like a windfall tax on energy firms. A Downing Street source said the government focused on growing the economy, adding the Queen's speech, where the government outlines its future policies, was coming up and those issues were utterly central to what the government is trying to do. The SNP called for an emergency budget earlier this month, saying the Tories had ignored the cost of living crisis brewing under its watch. Labour's Angela Rayner has condemned a sexist and misogynistic Mail on Sunday article which claims Tory MPs have accused her of a basic instinct ploy to distract Prime Minister Boris Johnson. The original Mail on Sunday story likened Rayner's alleged ploy to a fully clothed equivalent of Sharon Stone's infamous scene in the film Basic Instinct. The Prime Minister tweeted in response to the article, quote, As much as I disagree with Angela Rayner on almost every political issue, I respect her as a parliamentarian and deplore the misogyny directed at her anonymously today. The story which reported that Conservative MPs have accused Labour's deputy leader of deliberately distracting the Prime Minister by crossing and uncrossing her legs has received a huge backlash following its publication. Posting a dignified response to the article on social media on Sunday morning, Rayner thanked those for criticising the piece and making a stand in the name of decency. Nigerian police are looking for the owner of an illegal oil refinery where an explosion has killed at least 100 people according to local authorities. Many victims were burned beyond recognition. President Mohamedou Buhari has described the incident as a catastrophe and a natural disaster. Illegal refining is attractive in parts of the Niger Delta as it is seen as being relatively easy to pull off despite efforts to halt the practice. The damage to fishing and farming caused by the oil industry over the decades and the failure to share the oil wealth has led some to find other ways to make money. Dozens were thought to have been working at the refined plants in Imo State, southern Nigeria, when they were caught in the huge fire. The death toll has risen as emergency workers go through the scene with the number killed now standing at 109. At least 10 people have been killed after a tourist boat went missing off the northern Japanese island of Hokkaido, the Japanese Coast Guard says. The search is continuing in the frigid waters for 16 others who were on board the Kazu 1 vessel. Contact with the boat was lost after it said it was taking on water at 1.15pm local time on Saturday. 
The Kazu 1 is believed to have been on a three hour sightseeing voyage around the Shirekato Peninsula. The area is an undesignated UNESCO World Heritage Site, and boat trips are popular with tourists hoping to spot whales and sea lions, as well as brown bears on the rocky beaches. The crew managed to signal the vessel was tipping to a 30 degree angle and starting to sink, according to Japanese media. Of the, of the 26 on board, two were crew and two were children. And finally, a woman had to be rescued by firefighters after falling into a toilet while trying to find her mobile phone that had accidentally been dropped in. The woman, who was not named, was at the top of Mount Walker in the Olympic National Forest, northwest of Seattle, Washington State, when the incident occurred near a car park. She had been using her phone when it suddenly fell into a vault toilet, which is a non-flush toilet which is constructed with a vault or seal container that is buried deep in the ground. The local fire chief said the woman managed to take the toilet seat off and dog leads to try and get the phone. When this didn't work, she used the leads to tie herself to the toilet as she reached for it. But this resulted in her falling in head first. The woman tried to get out for 10 to 15 minutes as she was on her own. She managed to call 911 after being reunited with her phone in the toilet. Firefighters passed her block to stand on to reach a harness when they arrived and pulled her out of the vault. And on that sticky situation, I'm Elliot King. George Galloway and the mother of all talk shows. Join us at the College of Knowledge where there are no tuition fees. A staggering 43,100 people have voted on our poll. Will Imran Khan return as Pakistan Prime Minister? Hold that result. 48,000 people have voted on our poll. Will Imran Khan return as Pakistan Prime Minister? And it's bad news for the imported government. On Twitter, A, yes, 95%. B, no, 5%. On YouTube, yes, 95%, no, 5%. And on Telegram, only a little less, yes, 83%, no, 17%. Get voting uh, on that uh, poll. Uh, no news from uh, Islamabad, from uh, the PTI, uh, with whom we solemnly and carefully booked uh, Imran Khan for tonight's show. Please don't try to imply otherwise. otherwise. If there's been a mistake, man up to it. Don't uh, try to divert the blame to us. Please, I ask with all respect. We love Imran Khan. We're trying to help Imran Khan. We're trying to be a platform that can inform people in Western countries exactly what happened in Pakistan. Because they're certainly not going to learn it from the BBC or Sky, or ITV, or Channel 4, or the Daily Telegraph, or the London Times. This is not just the only, but by far and away, the biggest platform uh, that Prime Minister Imran Khan could have appeared on in the English-speaking world. And there's still time for him to uh, do that. Before I go to our next guest and switch gear uh, a little, uh, I need to uh, encourage you again uh, to make a donation. And I want to stress this point. I don't want a big donation. I really don't. I want you to give one pound or one dollar, even less than one pound, to keep the mother of all talk shows going. We already lost the midweek extra, replaced by, from my living room, uh, the Galloway show free-to-air, no-budget television. We lost the moats extra for financial reasons. Don't make us lose the mother of all talk shows. Think where you'd be on a Sunday night if we were not here. Think how bereft of a different point of view you would be. So it is coming up on the screen. It is ever easier. Next week it will be even easier. You can actually text your donation in from your uh, phone. Now there's, I think, 10 tickets left uh, in for the Oxford showing of my film, Killing Kelly in Oxford 
Town Hall tomorrow night. There it is, Oxford Town Hall, 7 p.m. Everybody in Oxford knows where the Town Hall is. It's a very grand building indeed, and also a building in which I've had some of my very best public meetings. So I, I think there's about 10 seats left. Please make sure you get them. Snap them up between now and uh, tomorrow. Uh, my favourite, my bonnie lies over the ocean. It's Caleb Mopan, my former colleague and the founder and director of the Center for Political Innovation in the United States. He's basically seeking to build uh, a party, a patriotic and socialist party in the United States of America. And I pray to God that he succeeds. Caleb, uh, welcome to the show. It must be even more difficult in the United States in these heightened days of war fervor uh, than it is here in Britain. But I've got to tell you, I think the Ukraine mania has begun to wear a bit thin on this side of the ocean. How goes it over on your side? Oh, we're observing exactly the same thing. Uh, you know, just right now as we speak, uh, we have an outreach team at the White House in, uh, near, you know, in Washington, D.C., handing out leaflets. Russia is not our enemy. Wall Street is. Uh, we've been doing that in New York City and around the country. And we are getting a very positive reaction from people. At the beginning, sure, there was this surge of emotions from mainstream media. But that's starting to break. Uh, people are really sick of it on some level. And a lot of people are watching American news and saying, this looks an awful lot like propaganda. You know, every Russian is portrayed as a vicious, evil murder. Every, every Ukrainian, even though some of them are Nazis and they have an official Nazi division, every Ukrainian is, is portrayed as a heroic fighter. American news is so obviously war propaganda at this point. A lot of people are sick of it and aren't buying it and are open to hearing another side. And that's why we've seen the big crackdown on voices like RT on YouTube channels and others who are daring to show the other side because people are hungry for it. People are very, very hungry for it. Yeah, I was going to turn to that latter issue and, and, and I will. Uh, but let me look at, if you like, the corollary of that. Uh, the, uh, the media, which has not been cracked down upon, is cracking up under the pressure of mass Boycott. Uh, CNN Plus uh, is to close when its audience reached 10,000. In the whole world, 10,000. And it's now closed down. The corollary is also true, isn't it? That it's uh, not just that news that people might find uh, more trustworthy cannot be found, but the official news nobody wants to watch. Sure. I mean, Netflix is also losing subscribers. Uh, Elon Musk has become kind of a hero on social media because he's beating the drum about how obnoxious the pounding of woke ideology into the heads of, of the masses, whether it's from CNN, whether it's from Netflix, whether it's from the social media giants, is becoming. Average Americans are sick of this, and they're looking at the fact that the gas prices are rising. They're looking at the cost of food, and they're getting sick and tired of it. Uh, and, you know, at the end of the day, there's a lot of working class young people in the United States who bought into it. And during the pandemic, uh, they went out and they protested and they rioted and they raged against racism and stood up against the police state. But now they're looking at their lives and saying, OK, a lot of windows were broken. OK, a lot of anger has been made. A lot of social media posts have gone viral. But have our lives gotten any better? Have things really improved for American working families? And a lot of a lot of working people in the United States, a lot of working class youth are saying, no, they haven't really gotten better. And when it really gets down to it, wokeism is a false messiah. It's coming in and promising to rejuvenate the country, to offer redemption. If you just say all the right buzzwords and all the key phrases, you know, the curse hanging over U.S. society from its foundations of slavery and genocide of the Native Americans will somehow be lifted. But it's a false messiah, they're realizing, because at the end of the day, the problem is economic. The problem is the economic foundations, capitalism, and a system of production organized for profit. And you're not going to get rid of that with buzzwords. 
And you're not going to get rid of that with workshops, uh, you know, where people talk about their emotions and feelings. You're going to have to address the economic foundations of the problem. And when it gets down to it, our leaders here in the United States do not care about the working class. They don't care about working families. Their only concern is enriching the profits of huge multinational corporations. And they are waging economic warfare around the world in the form of sanctions. Uh, they've escalated this Ukraine crisis, taking us to the brink of World War III. Uh, they don't care about the consequences for working people here or around the world. And the problems are in the economic foundations, not the buzzwords, not the phrases, uh, not going back and uh, adjusting Disney movies to make them politically correct. That's not going to solve the fundamental problem. We truly are two hearts that beat as one, uh, Caleb, uh, uh, and I thank you for that soliloquy, which could as powerfully have been made uh, here in Britain and maybe in other uh, European countries also. And particularly for what you said on that wave of outrage, that upsurge that took place uh, over the last year or so in the United States. It went up like a rocket, but it came down just a burnt stick, didn't it? Uh, a lot of uh, property trashed, uh, but uh, nothing changed at the end of it, because that doesn't bring change. Minding your pronouns doesn't bring political and economic uh, change. And until people see that and unite with people who are maybe clumsy with their pronouns, are maybe clumsy with their attitude to uh, the various uh, uh, sexual uh, orientations that I increasingly discover exist, uh, at least uh, on rainbow flags and in, on Twitter and so on. Uh, there's, uh, there's ways of doing things I, I never knew existed. And uh, fair play, let a thousand flowers bloom. We want to interfere in no one's personal life. But until we can unite everybody against the one thing that oppresses everybody, we're not going to make any progress, are we? Absolutely not. And the scary thing is that at this point, there is a pending global food crisis. You know, Ukraine is a wheat producing country. And because of the conflict that the United States has provoked there and is now escalating, pouring more weapons in, their wheat output, according to a lot of sources in Russia, uh, their wheat output is going to be roughly 50 percent of what it usually is. And if you add to that uh, the fact that Russian fertilizer has been held off because of the sanctions from the United States, um, if you add to that the fact that uh, we're at this point in the United States anticipating a lot of droughts and wildfires all throughout farming states in the Midwest of the United, United States, the, there's going to be a global food crisis. There's going to be food shortages. And this is an emergency. And our leaders should be convening an international meeting about how to resolve this food crisis. There's, there's already been malnutrition-related deaths rising on the African continent due to the pandemic. But what's coming up is going to be a meltdown of the global food apparatus, food production, and our leaders don't seem concerned about it. Uh, it, it. It's shocking to me to watch, you know, Joe Biden and Kamala Harris and, and your leaders in Britain and, you know, the leaders of NATO. Uh, they realize that their actions escalating with Russia are going to cause people to go hungry, not not just around the world, but in the Western countries themselves. And they don't seem at all concerned about this. You know, the USA has been waging economic warfare against Venezuela. They grabbed Alex Saab uh, off of his airplane because he was trying to arrange, allegedly, for Iran to export food to Venezuela. The USA has been trying to starve the people of Venezuela, uh, you know, with, with sanctions. Um, you look at what Joe Biden did in Afghanistan, where after the USA devastated the country with 20 years of occupation, uh, then the USA pulled out and then froze all their funds and their money in the middle of an economic crisis. And, and Afghans were, were left to go hungry. Uh, their, their money was, was taken from them. Joe Biden is very much the starvation president. That's what he's going to be remembered as. He is the president uh, who presided over hunger. You remember when he was in the Obama administration, he and Obama became the first presidents in U.S. history to cut 
the amount of food assistance that goes to low-income families. No president before had ever reduced the amount of, of food assistance low-income families got through the food stamps program, the supplemental nutrition assistance program. Uh, but, but that was what Biden was when he was vice president. And now he's presiding over policies that are going to cause people to starve. It's, it's shocking to me uh, what's, what's on the horizon due to their economic warfare, and they're not concerned about it. Well, of course, everything in, uh, in the economy is rationed. Uh, it's often a word that's used uh, to frighten the horses. Uh, but uh, normally in capitalist society, things are rationed by price. Uh, you can get food, but only if you can pay the ever escalating price of it. Uh, what are we uh, demanding here? Uh, it seems to me that uh, we'll soon be in the position uh, where we'll have to demand uh, that the poor and the, and the low paid and even the lower part of the middle class are able to get uh, their fair share of a declining amount of food. Seems incredible that we're having this conversation in 2022, but you're absolutely right. Russia's the biggest wheat producer and Ukraine is the second biggest. If Ukraine's harvest falls by half and we're not allowed to buy Russian wheat, ipso facto, you've got a food crisis. Indeed, and our leaders seem to be fine with that. Uh, as long as it helps them wage their campaign to beat down Russia, to beat down China, to beat down Iran or Venezuela or Cuba or any independent country. I mean, the world is really led by a group of insane Malthusians. I mean, you read these documents where they're talking about overpopulation. There's just too many people in the world. They say we've got to reduce the population, reduce consumption, drive down living standards. Um, there is a, a very maniacally evil group of people that sit at the top of the global capitalist system uh, that have a, a very sinister agenda. And they don't seem to care about the consequences for average working people. Uh, they're thinking like monopolists. You know, when there's a storm, the big fish survive and the little fish go go under and die. Uh, you know, you can talk about how Walmart, you know, we all know about Walmart in the United States. When they come to a town, uh, they, they lower their prices and put their competitors out of business business. Uh, and then the people who work at those smaller businesses lose their jobs. And then uh, once they've gained control of the market, the prices rise up once again. And this pandemic has created an opportunity for the sinister monopolists uh, that dominate global capitalism, uh, the big oil bankers, uh, you know, the folks uh, on Silicon Valley, uh, you know, Bill Gates uh, and, and others, uh, the Rockefellers, they sit at the center of a global financial system that is essentially trying to set the world on fire in order to secure their position. Uh, and it's utterly terrifying. And the interest of working people all over the world, as well as the interest of small business owners, uh, as well as the interest of entire nations uh, around the world is against them. Um, you know, and what they are doing, I mean, they're taking humanity on a suicide mission, essentially, uh, in order to secure their position at the top of the hill. And uh, there is a rising resistance to it uh, in the West. There's a rising resistance to it around the world. And, you know, I mean, you talk about Imran Khan. I mean, he was targeted because he's somebody who has stood up for the people of Pakistan. He stood up for them. Right. Uh, you know, and you talk about about the Belt and Road Initiative and the China-Pakistan Economic Corridor, uh, there is a rising movement of resistance around the world trying to raise living standards, raise people out of poverty, have sustainable economic development, get beyond fossil fuels to a higher mode of energy, like fusion energy, right? Not, not reduce living standards to deal with climate change, but unleash human creativity and change our relationship with the environment. Um, that, that alternative is what they're trying to suppress. And yet, and yet, all of this is being presided over, uh, at least in the Anglosphere, uh, by two of the least convincing political leaders that anyone could ever have seen on the political stage. Uh, Boris Johnson bumbling from uh, crisis to crisis, maybe even uh, to oblivion uh, in a few weeks' time when the local elections uh, here take place may be overthrown in an internal uh, conservative party coup. And in the United States, well, not to put too fine a point on it, 
uh, I would not send your president out to buy a loaf, at least not expecting him to come back with the right bread or the right change. And yet these two powers, the United States and the United Kingdom, are behaving as if they were themselves politically and economically stable. How do you account for that? At the end of the day, the emperor has no clothes, uh, and, and the whole world knows it. And the crackdown that we're seeing and the silencing of dissident voices, anyone who dares not go along with this, uh, that's rooted in their desperation. Because at the end of the day, they know that they, on some level, don't know what they're doing. On some level, the world is not going to go along with their agenda. Um, when I see how they're just coming for everybody, anyone who dares question this is being targeted. Alice Walker, uh, the novelist who, who wrote uh, The Color Purple, is you know just a definitive African-American woman in American literature, has been banned from the Bay Area Book Fair. They're arguing that she must be anti-Semitic because she stands with the Palestinian people. Um, and they have banned her from the Bay Area Book Fair. They're, they're trying to silence one of the greatest voices in American literature right now. They are desperate to just silence and shut down any voice that points out what is actually going on. Um, because at this point, people don't like the, the pending meltdown that, that they're planning. I mean, people are tired of these lockdowns. People are tired of the devastating economic impact that all of this has had. And they want justice and, uh, and they want to know that their kids are going to have food to eat and that there's going to be, you know, there's going to be roads in their neighborhood that aren't crumbling and falling apart. I mean, things that are just pretty basic are in the process of being denied uh, to people in the United States. And pretty soon, something like the yellow vests in France is going to come to the United States. We don't know when. But it's only a matter of time. We saw the trucker convoy in Canada. Uh, we've seen Occupy Wall Street. We've seen Black Lives Matter. We've seen the Tea Party. There is going to be some kind of working class rebellion against these conditions being unleashed by our leaders right now. And when that comes, uh, it's going to shake the country. And they know it's it's only a matter of time before it happens. They're trying to preempt it. They're trying to, to label it fascist, label it Nazi before it ever happens, because they know uh, the working people are not going to take it anymore. Um, and there is going to be a resistance from different sectors of U.S. society. The African-American community, they're going to make their voice heard. Uh, you know, low-income folks in, in rural states and, and Appalachia, they're going to make their voices heard. Uh, you know, the, the people in the suburban neighborhoods that used to be prosperous throughout the United States and are now crumbling with empty foreclosed homes. They're going to make their voices heard. The farmers are going to make their voices heard. Uh, you know, the working working people, the young people that are stuck in a cycle of low-wage, short-term service sector jobs, there's going to be an explosion coming, and they know it. They know this explosion is coming, and they're trying to preempt it uh, with this woke cancel culture where every voice that dares speak up and say what's actually going on gets shut down and silenced. Caleb Mopan, a privilege, as always, to talk with you. Thanks for coming on board the mother of all talk shows. Let me take a quick break. There is no trick other than hard work, creativity, care, and recognizing that duty is more important than love. The booming voice of Robert Maxwell, an arrogant man who used his publishing empire to gain him power and influence. But in this shocking account, never told before in this way, George Galloway recalls his first encounter with Maxwell. It looked like a, a grizzly bear uh, advancing towards me and punches me with these giant fists like sides of ham, right in the solar plexus. So hard that I literally bent double. Then, after George exposed Maxwell as a crook in Parliament, it was war. Every one of his papers, the Daily Mirror, then following the Sunday Mirror, the Sunday People, the Daily Record, then a few days later, the Sunday Mail in Scotland. Even the European, which he then owned all over Galloway. Scottish Daily News journalist Ron Mackay was there. Every night, presumably when he had a drink in him, he would boom over the tannoy about the, 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 the cretins, the fools. 
the, the majority of the workforce believed that he would take it over and their jobs would be secure. But of course he didn't. He just disappeared. And then... The millionaire newspaper publisher Robert Maxwell is dead. What really happened? Did Robert Maxwell jump or was he pushed? It could be that he went out to, as he did, miturate over the side of the boat. I'm with Ghislaine Maxwell in that I lean towards the murder. This is Maxwell the monster. You said, what is my secret? I will let you and your viewers know what it is. I'm not attached to property. Consequently, losing or gaining it means nothing to me. Some great stuff going up on Patreon now, thanks to my good friend Simon. Uh, you can listen to my audiobook on the 1970s. Uh, just go to patreon.com forward slash George Galloway. And finally, my sequel to my novel Queensway has arrived. It's called Black Lake and it's a Queensway novel. It is imagining uh, that uh, we had failed to stop Hitler crossing the channel, that we were betrayed instead of saved by our heroes who resisted Nazi invasion in 1940 and 41. And it supposes that some of our ruling class would have as they did in every other occupied European country, defect to the enemy and try to sell them goods and services in the British way. But the other sections of the ruling class and the vast majority of the working class, uh, led by its socialist uh, wing and its trade union wing, took up arms against the Nazi occupier of Britain. I think it's a cracking story, but then I wrote it. So I hope that you will order it. You can get it from my shop. Uh, don't forget to donate. I don't know if it's uh, coming up on the screen, but we need to pay for this show before the end of it or shortly after it. So please, don't delay. Make a donation now or right after the show. A small donation, $1, one pound. That's all I need from you. Let's go to line one where Simon in London awaits. Simon, welcome to the show. How are you doing, George? You okay? All good. Thanks for calling. What would you like to say? That's great. Well, this week, Westminster Magistrate Court approved the extradition of uh, Julian Assange and passed the case on to the Home Secretary for approval. And most people would no doubt argue now that his fate is pretty much sealed and that he'll sadly face a prison sentence of 175 years and a maximum security prison in the U.S. And there's very little chance that someone as heartless and ruthless and brutal as Pretty Patel would let a guy like Assange go. However, I'm still hopeful this extradition will, won't take place, even though it's a fool's hope. And the reason is because it's being rather underplayed, but let's face it, despite her sheer brutality and cruelty, Pretty Patel, that, that, that Pretty Patel is capable of, she is highly ambitious and she has used different machinations in her power to elevate her career, as we saw with the, um, uh, 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 during her time with, uh, in the uh, Theresa May um, uh, government. Now, just think what effect, it's unlikely, but just think of the effect that, uh, that, that it would have if, uh, on, on her career if she let Assange go. Firstly, there's five things. Firstly, it would portray her as someone who's not afraid to say no to the U.S., just like her idol, Margaret Thatcher, was in leading and advising Ronald Reagan, effectively becoming Reagan's brain, you know? So and Jeff, the, Joe Biden is definitely needs uh, someone who needs a brain from the Anglosphere, uh, and perhaps Julia, uh, perhaps Pri Patel could do this more than effectively than anyone else has. Secondly, in effect, uh, it helped the Tories win the local elections and take all the attention of Boris. Thirdly, it'll catapult her to the front of the line for the candidacy for the... Um, a Tory leadership, if that was uh, if that was something that were that, that were to happen and Boris were to go, and her insane immigration policies, the fourth fourth thing, would actually be welcomed. And fifth, 
it would somewhat consolidate the Red Wall seats for her, especially with the, with the, with, the, with people like myself and you who don't like Keir Starmer, who actually flew to Sweden in order to persuade the Swedish authorities to keep false rape charges on Assange and provided them with legal advice as to how to keep the pressure on Assange. Now, I know it's a huge, there's huge downsides to this as well. I'm not, personally, I'm not a fan of Pretty Patel, but sometimes in life, as opposed to depending on the right person to do the right thing, you have to depend on the wrong person to do the right thing. So I was just wondering what your take on that would be, George. Would that, would, do you see that happening? Well, it's very powerful. Uh, <clears throat> it's very powerful. It's very imaginative and creative thinking. And you made a good case. You persuaded me. Uh, but I doubt that you'll persuade her. Uh, as I always say, if my auntie had a beard, she'd be my uncle. Although... Nowadays, you can never be entirely sure. I'm uh, pretty certain that Pretty Patel will rubber stamp uh, the American demand. As I understand it, though I'm not a lawyer and I'm not an expert, I'm on the periphery of the official Assange campaign teams. Uh, I'm never on their platforms uh, for their important gatherings and so on. So I, I really don't know what the inside chatter is. I don't meet them. Uh, but there are, I think, still some legal avenues that can be explored, and I very much hope that we can avert this fate, worse than death, that you describe. And because it is a fate worse than death, uh, then it uh, raises the spectre, which caused the original Westminster Magistrates Court decision not to send Julian Assange to the United States. It raises that whole spectre of self-harm, of suicide, all over again. Uh, 59,000 people have voted on our poll. Uh, will Imran Khan return as Prime Minister? It is still overwhelming. 95%, 95%, 86%. Say yes. So, so far we haven't got uh, Imran. Imran, here's my credentials. You know me well. Here's my Helale Kadiazam. Get your people to get on the line, please. Uh, if you want to call the show, 08081 And if you're in America or Canada, plus 1844 Double four. Let's go to Hamza in the great city of Liverpool. Go ahead, Hamza. Hi, George. How are you today? Hello. By the grace of Hi, God, George. good. Thanks. What would you like to say? Yeah. Uh, yeah. George, I just want to say, go I'm on. a father of four. First of all, I want to talk about intensity of the subject, what you have chosen today. Yeah, with to talk to pre Imran Khan. He's still our prime minister, first of all. Yeah, let me say that. Yeah, from the bottom of my heart. Yeah, I, I, I love those, all those comments which you were talking about, but I wish you would have focused only and only on pre Imran Khan today because there are, I, I just take my wife as a millions of those people wise, right? because I haven't come across to a single person in the last three years who does not support Imran Khan. And, you know, this is all so fake, what's going on in Pakistan right now, with the favor of all these club politicians and this, I don't want to say that, because we, as a Pakistan, we love, even British Pakistan, but we still love our Pakistan army. But you know what? We are, we are forced to say there is some kind of hidden influences in there, in between. It's there. So people have to see that. And before people have to see, those people who are sitting on those influential places, they need to realize and come up with the, come up with the real democracy, where the people really are. I'm a father of four, and I wish right now, you know what, I heard you last one hour, and I heard you many times before. I'm one of your subscribers, by the way. Yeah, I love you. I love to listen to you. And I would have given to you all my wages, you know, just by choosing this subject of being in my heart. Yeah, this is how much we love him. People will, because he talks about humanity. You know, one of your, you know, participants today said that it's not about anybody. It's about the people who stand for humanity. 
Imran Khan is somebody who stands for humanity, George. You know, that's why we follow him. I am somebody also, like Kesha was saying, that my father, mother, my sisters in Pakistan, they are from PMLN, you know, the Nawaz Sharif who's sitting in Mayfair right now in London. You know, I wish somebody, somebody could really take, a, you know, justice, justice, you know, on the merits in this country also to find out where they're getting all their wealth from, you know. We people like us who left our countries and come to these countries to work here and to make our dreams come true. For once, we thought that maybe we could go back to Pakistan. But you know what? Now, this, I don't know, this regime or this corrupt politician or Pakistan army, whoever, but they have killed our dreams to go back to Pakistan. They have killed our dreams, George. You know, I am somebody who is here from 2002. This, I, I've been issued second British passport, and I love Britain. You know why? Because at least today I want to talk to Jaws, and I can talk to Jaws. But in Pakistan, you can't do that. That's the thing. That's the thing that because the Prime Minister Pakistan, if, if, if Imran Khan, and you know all the people who work for less than ten dollars a day, you know they. You know, they're thinking that their voice will be heard. Their voices will be heard. But you know what? Your passion is unmistakable. You moved me, uh, Hamza, but there's a lot of people trying to get through, so I need to uh, uh, close you now. Uh, your passion is unmistakable. It's shared uh, by me and by the vast majority. I'm absolutely sure of it in Pakistan. If the elections, which must be held now, are free and fair, Imran Khan will sweep the country. He will definitely win a two-thirds majority of that, I'm absolutely sure. And the people are on the march. I don't think they will be turned back. I don't think the ordinary soldiers in the army uh, will be prepared to fire upon them, to turn them back. And so uh, when they reach Islamabad, if they are in sufficient numbers, and backed and supported around the world by sufficient numbers, then I believe the people's will will triumph. Let's hear from Akhtar in Manchester. Go ahead, Akhtar. Oh, hello, George. Nice talking to you, to be very honest. I listen to your shows, and it's been really amazing. I would like to say thank you very much for you. You have, um, to be very honest, a very, very uh, great eyes on Pakistani politics. And, uh, you know, uh, this is what we actually think um, made us shameful being a Pakistani when uh, uh, such kind of politicians, idiots, I, I'm sorry, but I, I must say these are idiots, when they say they are beggars. I mean, like, how you can say you are the beggar? Being a nation of Pakistani, I belong to Pakistan, I feel really shame. When such a pupil, those are actually a beggar. They have escaped, they have... Everything, as you already explained about them, already uh, explained about the politics of Pakistan. Uh, lastly, I, I, I would like to say, uh, I mean, those criminals come to the Europe, uh, particularly in Britain, and live over here. What kind of action should we need to take to send them back, you know, where it's they belong from? from. Where, yeah. It's a very, I mean, like, very just, good point. Akhtar, uh, I wish I had an answer to that. I passed uh, one of uh, Nawaz Sharif's sumptuous Mayfair properties uh, just the other day. Uh, I was uh, on my uh, way. Uh, I better not say where. I don't want to encourage anyone to visit the property. But uh, sumptuous it was and guarded by private security. It was in numbers uh, because uh, these ill-gotten gains came from you. They talk about foreign funding from, for Imran. Uh, my goodness. Uh, these politicians who should be all sitting with, uh, with the electronic tags around their ankles weren't foreign funded. They looted Pakistan to fund themselves. They looted you and your family back home. They stole your money. They didn't get it from anywhere else. They allowed everywhere else to tell them what to do in exchange for a license 
to rob you, a license to rob Pakistan. That's the caliber of people that the United States has now put in power in Pakistan. Let's go to Lena in Birmingham on the same subject. Go ahead, Lena. Okay, thank you for having me. Um, so my question is quite straightforward. Um, so if Imran Khan does return as Prime Minister, um, just looking forward, do you believe the USA will in turn try and freeze assets or impose sanctions just as it has done in neighboring Afghanistan, and it would be in response to not adhering to the, what the USA basically want. Um, you know, it, it, it's done that in Afghanistan. It's frozen their assets um, just because they they wanted their own Islamic style of government. So well, my view on that, Lena, is that, uh, that uh, wealthy people in Eastern countries would be well advised to repatriate uh, whatever property values they have uh, to the East. Because if you don't agree to be a slave, the danger exists, as you say, uh, of your property and its value being frozen, stolen and maybe never given back. Uh, so it's high time that people in countries like Pakistan repatriated their wealth back to Pakistan. That's from where it came, and it should be used to invest and grow Pakistan, to grow the economy, to grow the society, to grow the culture and greatness of Pakistan. Uh, I think that Pakistan's future lies in the East, not in the West. Most Americans have no idea about Pakistan, where it is even, how it runs, how it functions, how it came to be. They know nothing, care less than nothing uh, about the lives of ordinary people in Pakistan. They want to use Pakistan, that's all, uh, in geostrategic affairs, use it against the then Soviet Union in Afghanistan, use it now against China, use it against Russia, use it for their own selfish interests. Pakistan's best interests lie in the East, in bolting itself on to the great Eurasian future, which I promise you, you sound like a young woman, I promise you for the rest of your life, will be growing and leaving the West far behind in its trail. Let me take a very quick break. Stay tuned. Big thanks, obviously, to all our subscribers and listeners to the Moats podcast. For the older amongst you, a podcast is the distilled version uh, about half as long as the three hour mother of all talk shows, uh, which has become a phenomenon uh, on the internet. And also my new Wednesday show, The Galloway Show, which I hope you'll tune into on my YouTube channel, exclusively on YouTube on Wednesday at seven o'clock. That's also got a podcast, which has also gone off like a rocket. Now you get them on Apple Podcasts and Spotify. But in recent weeks, the podcast has been the number one political podcast in Algeria, Ghana, Oman, Namibia, Ecuador, Slovenia, Zimbabwe, Malaysia, Bulgaria, Iceland, Kuwait, Costa Rica, South Africa, Saudi Arabia, Tanzania, and now in Singapore, number one in those countries. The podcasts also are regular in the top 50 of China, please note, Russia, France, Spain, India, Israel, Brazil, Pakistan, Canada, Hong Kong, and Japan, as well as being active in 79 other top 100s around the world. So it's a media phenomenon, and it's tearing up the mainstream uh, media 
Monopoly. Please uh, download it on Apple or Spotify and leave us a five-star review like Sanam in London, who said, George, I've been watching your show uh, for a long time, and I must admit that you are a true leader and very courageous man to carry on your work of exposing the truth and showing us the other side of the picture, which always gets blocked by the US and the West through their media. God bless you always. Sanam in London. Very touching, Sanam. Thank you very much uh, for that. You are listening to the mother of all talk shows with George Galloway. Well, the uh, first poll is about to close. The previous record poll ever was 10,000 votes. This one is 59,200 votes. And overwhelmingly, the people have voted for Imran Khan. They're voting for elections now. They're voting against the imported government of crooks that the United States has imposed upon their people, opposed upon their country. We've got uh, Gonzalo Lira coming up uh, very shortly, but let me take a call from California. Who wouldn't want to go to California? Keith is there. Uh, Keith, what would you like to say? Hey, George. Uh, thanks for taking my call. I appreciate it. Um, uh, this is just uh, basically the problem I have with this whole uh, uh, the Ukrainian situation with uh, the Russian invasion or whatever uh, name you'd like to put on it. Uh, me personally, I see this as Russian imperialism, and uh, I am an anti-imperialist myself, and I don't understand how it's not viewed as imperialism on Russia's side. Um and I have a specifically called, you had Caleb Moppin on here, and I just, uh, uh, but that, that's my whole basic point, uh, is you've got these Ukrainian folks, we've got 44 million people there, how many actual Nazis are there, how much of this is real, uh, very similar to the weapons of mass destruction in Iraq. Um, so what's your take on that? Well, uh, you're very welcome, uh, Keith. You're putting a view I profoundly disagree with, uh, but that's what this show is about. It's a university, after all. We mustn't have a monoculture or a monotone in a, in a university. I could not actually disagree with you more. Uh, this is a war between NATO and Russia and of the two parties. It's NATO that is the collection of imperialist countries. We could have a long Leninist discussion on the, the, the definition of imperialism, but I prefer to say that uh, like the camel, uh, it might be harder to define than it is to recognize. The United States, the United Kingdom, France, and the other NATO countries have launched imperialist war around the globe for 60 years. It would be uh, testing credulity to imagine uh, that they've suddenly changed their spots to mix the animal metaphor when it comes to Ukraine. Now, actually, Western Ukraine is a heavily Nazified society. It always has been. And if you knew about Ukraine, as I know about it, and if you don't, I suggest you watch on Netflix big thing in California, uh, the Netflix documentary made by French television called Einsatzgruppen, Einsatzgruppen, Hitler's executioners in Western Ukraine, motivated by Nazi ideology, uh, the Western Ukrainian political class and their street thugs massacred massacred in cold blood more than a million and a half people most of them Jews but not all of them Jews many were Polish Jews many were Ukrainian Jews they fell upon them like beasts 
And that mentality has never dissipated. In fact, the United States, as a matter of policy, the documents are there if you want to research them, identified and fastened on to these fascist elements as a potential asset that the United States could use to cause difficulties and division inside the former USSR. In 2004, uh, the first attempt to build a political power around these ultra-nationalist and even fascist and Nazi elements was attempted, and in 2014 the process was completed. A military coup uh, overthrew the elected government in Kiev. It was the American military uh, that engineered the coup. It was the American plenipotentiary, Victoria Newland, who orchestrated the coup. It overthrew the elected president of Ukraine, sent him running for his life. It burned down the parliament building in Kiev. It ordered the deputies at gunpoint to sign a raft of anti-Russian national and Russian language laws. So don't tell me that you see no Nazis because that means you're turning a Nelson's eye to the Nazis. You can see their swastikas if you want to. You can see their SS insignia if you want to. You can hear their jackboots marching if you want to. But that's not the only reason to oppose this war. This war is not an imperialist war because Russia is not strong enough to be an imperialist country. Russia gave up its empire and was cheered in the West for doing so. But what Russia will not allow is the empire of the United States to situate nuclear weapons underneath their windows in the ramparts of the remaining Russian Federation. And as a man who uses the lingua franca uh, of socialism, I suspect, Keith, that you already knew all of that, unless, unless you are one of the useful idiots that have been pink-washed or idiot-walked into the ranks of the imperialists themselves. Goodbye, Keith, in California. Coming up in the next hour is a man who knows about what's really happening in Ukraine. It's Gonzalo Lira. And we've got Mark Seddon, the legendary labor man, former United Nations man on Partygate, Boris Johnson, and the local elections coming up in Britain. Maybe he's also got a point of view on little Macron, uh, the newly re-elected emperor of France. Thanks to the 60,000 plus people who voted on our poll. Imran Khan's definitely coming back as Prime Minister if we have got anything to do with it. Don't forget to donate and call the show, especially if you disagree with me. After the news with Elliot King, I'll be back with the final hour. Voting has just closed in the French presidential election with exit polls predicting a shock result. And I can tell you that the far right Marine Le Pen has been narrowly defeated by incumbent Emmanuel Macron. 
French voters were faced with two very different visions for their country during Sunday's presidential runoff election as the centrist President Macron sought to fend off a challenge from Le Pen. Macron pitched a vision of a globalised France at the head of a strong European Union. Le Pen put forward an economical, nationalist, more inward-looking platform that would represent a fundamental shift from the direction France has since taken since the Second World War. This was a rematch of the 2017 contest where Macron bested Le Pen by nearly two to one. This one is predicted to be much closer. Macron's attempt at diplomacy over the war in Ukraine took him away from the campaign trail, while Le Pen was forced to backtrack on her previous support for President Vladimir Putin. She has long been a vocal admirer of the Russian president, even visiting him during her 2017 campaign and her party took out a loan from a Czech Russian bank several years ago. Le Pen put herself in a strong position by focusing on costs of living issues, veering away from the typical far-right platform focused on immigration, security and identity that dominated her 2017 campaign. However, she did not abandon some of her most controversial policies, like banning Muslim women from wearing headscarves in public. Removing Prime Minister Boris Johnson from Downing Street would lead to instability and uncertainty in the country, according to the Conservative Party's chairman. The Prime Minister has come under increasing pressure from MPs after being fined by the police for attending a party in Number 10 during the first lockdown. Some senior Tories have now joined opposition calls for Prime Minister Johnson to go. Oliver Dowden said changing leader right now would not be in the national interest. The party chairman said the UK faced unparalleled challenges over national security and energy supplies and it was right for the Prime Minister to focus on that. Labour Party leader Sir Keir Starmer said the PM's authority was shot through and the so-called Partygate scandal was stopping Parliament discussing issues like the cost of living crisis. The SNP's Westminster leader Ian Blackford also said Mr Johnson now had no moral authority to lead after being fined for Covid breaking laws. Last week, Mr Johnson, along with his wife Carrie and Chancellor Rishi Sunak, were fined by police for attending a birthday party thrown in his honour in the Cabinet Room in June 2020. Labour is calling for an emergency budget in Britain to bring forward measures to tackle the costs of the living crisis. Surges in fuel, energy and food prices are hitting people's pockets, with inflation running at a 30-year high. Labour leader Sir Keir Starmer says the government's response had been woeful and demanded further measurements like a windfall tax on energy firms. A Downing Street source said the government focused on growing the economy, adding the Queen's speech, where the government outlines its future policies, was coming up and those issues were utterly central to what the government is trying to do. The SNP called for an emergency budget earlier this month, saying the Tories had ignored the cost of living crisis brewing under its watch. Labour's Angela Rayner has condemned a sexist and misogynistic Mail on Sunday article which claims Tory MPs have accused her of a basic instinct ploy to distract Prime Minister Boris Johnson. The original Mail on Sunday story likened Rayner's alleged ploy to a fully clothed equivalent of Sharon Stone's infamous scene in the film Basic Instinct. The Prime Minister tweeted in response to the article, quote, As much as I disagree with Angela Rayner on almost every political issue, I respect her as a parliamentarian and deplore the misogyny directed at her anonymously today. The story which reported that Conservative MPs have accused Labour's deputy leader of deliberately distracting the Prime Minister by crossing and uncrossing her legs has received a huge backlash following its publication. Posting a dignified response to the article on social media on Sunday morning, Rayner thanked those for criticising the piece and making a stand in the name of decency. Nigerian police are looking for the owner of an illegal oil refinery where an explosion has killed at least 100 people according to local authorities. Many victims were burned beyond recognition. President Mohamedou Buhari has described the incident as a catastrophe and a natural disaster. Illegal refining is attractive in parts of the Niger Delta as it is seen as being relatively easy to pull off despite efforts to halt the practice. The damage to fishing and farming caused by the oil industry over the decades and the failure to share the oil wealth has led some to find other ways to make money. Dozens were thought to have been working at the refined plants in Imo State, southern Nigeria, when they were caught in the huge fire. 
The death toll has risen as emergency workers go through the scene with the number killed now standing at 109. At least 10 people have been killed after a tourist boat went missing off the northern Japanese island of Hokkaido, the Japanese Coast Guard says. The search is continuing in the frigid waters for 16 others who were on board the Kazu 1 vessel. Contact with the boat was lost after it said it was taking on water at 1.15pm local time on Saturday. The Kazu 1 is believed to have been on a three hour sightseeing voyage around the Shirekato Peninsula. The area is an undesignated UNESCO World Heritage Site and boat trips are popular with tourists hoping to spot whales and sea lions as well as brown bears on the rocky beaches. The crew managed to signal the vessel was tipping to a 30 degree angle and starting to sink according to Japanese media. Of the, of the 26 on board, two were crew and two were children. And finally, a woman had to be rescued by firefighters after falling into a toilet while trying to find her mobile phone that had accidentally been dropped in. The woman, who was not named, was at the top of Mount Walker in the Olympic National Forest, northwest of Seattle, Washington State, when the incident occurred near a car park. She had been using her phone when it suddenly fell into a vault toilet, which is a non-flush toilet which is constructed with a vault or seal container that is buried deep in the ground. The local fire chief said the woman managed to take the toilet seat off and dog leads to try and get the phone. When this didn't work, she used the leads to tie herself to the toilet as she reached for it. But this resulted in her falling in head first. The woman tried to get out for 10 to 15 minutes as she was on her own. She managed to call 911 after being reunited with her phone in the toilet. Firefighters passed her block to stand on to reach a harness when they arrived and pulled her out of the vault. And on that sticky situation, I'm Elliot King. George Galloway and the mother of all talk shows. Join us at the College of Knowledge where there are no tuition fees. Now there's a second poll out. Will Prime Minister Boris Johnson be out before May is out? Good pun. Uh, May, of course, being the date of the local council elections when people will pass judgment on the state we're in, or more particularly the state our government is in, our cabinet and our prime minister. And if they were to return a very unfavorable verdict, it seems to me inevitable that the Conservative members of Parliament, who after all, like almost all members of Parliament, care only about their own re-election, uh, will pull the rug from beneath them. Uh, so you can vote on that on my Twitter account, on my YouTube channel and on my Telegram. Now, uh, I'm always glad to welcome back a guest. Uh, but I can say without fear of contradiction, I have never been as glad to welcome back a guest as I am my next guest. We thought we'd lost him, but his life has been spared. He can't appear on the screen for reasons which are probably obvious, because his life may yet still be in danger. He's the Chilean American filmmaker, author, and businessman stuck in Kharkov in the middle of a war. He's Gonzalo Lira and he joins me now. I don't know uh, quite how to put it in words, Gonzalo, but welcome back. Thank you very much, George, and sorry I was a no-show last week. <laughs> Hello, do you hear me? A funny, a funny thing happened to you on the way to the studio. Yeah, exactly right. Exactly right. Listen, I, before I say anything else, you know, uh, I, yesterday I, I saw finally the, um, because I'd heard about it, I saw the, the, the incredibly, um, the wonderful statement you made uh, when I didn't show up to your program last Sunday. And uh, I want to commend you and thank you so much for the moral clarity of your statement. Because a lot of people would have said, oh, you know, a guest didn't show up and that's that. And, you know, fingers crossed and just would have changed the subject. 
But uh, I so appreciated the fact that you shone a strong spotlight on my situation because I truly believe, George, and I want you to know this, um, I truly believe that your attention to my particular case made a huge difference to the outcome. And I want you to know that. And, I want, uh, and I'm glad that this is public so that everybody can, can hear what I'm saying. Because it truly... It, well, that's, truly uh, that's most that kind. Uh, that most kind of you, me, Gonzalo. Uh, yeah. I, uh, I, 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 I thank God for it myself. Uh, but that's just me. But I think you should know that thousands of people, thousands and thousands around the world, were praying either religiously or secularly for your uh, safekeeping and for your release. Are you able to tell us? Perhaps you're not. We won't judge you if you're not. Are you able to tell us what happened? Yes, but before I do that, I just want to thank all those wonderful, wonderful people who sent good wishes to me and, and who, who were praying and worrying for me. I thank you so much. And there was a wonderful woman who was on your show just now, a woman named Corrine. And I want to thank her, uh, yes. you know, just as much as I would thank anyone, because I, I could hear in her voice how worried she, and concerned she was for my, for my well-being. And it's so humbling. And I thank her, and I thank everyone else listening. But I do want to point out something. I'm extremely fortunate, but there are other people who are not so fortunate. For instance, Julian Assange. For instance, uh, the, the uh, people who have been jailed because of the so-called uh, January 6th riot. Some of the people who were in the Canadian convoy who have been jailed and, and their livelihoods and their, and their savings stripped from them, stolen from them by the state. There are a lot of people who are suffering a lot of injustices in the West. And I thank you so much for your concern for me. And I'd ask you very humbly to redirect that concern to other people in our society, in the, in the collective West, who are suffering under the yoke of these illegitimate regimes that are supposed to be our leaders, that are supposed to represent us, but represent the moneyed interests, the Western oligarchs. And do keep in mind, George, you know, I, I have never made any bones about it. I am a man of the right. I'm a, a, a center-right person. I am not a, a person of the left, uh, certainly not a socialist or a communist. But the people in charge who are in control in the West are corrupt oligarchs that we should be doing something about. And their, their hideous disregard for the common decencies and the natural rights that we have all, uh, uh, that, that we are heirs to, it is destroying the civilization of the West. It is destroying democracy and all that is good and decent of the Western civilization. And I, I, I would ask everyone of every political stripe to, uh, you know, acknowledge this fact and try to work against these oligarchs who are crushing the spirit out of our wonderful civilization that has built up so much, but is now so rapidly falling apart. Yeah, I'm sorry if I'm ranting, but it's something that I really wanted to get off my chest. No, no, it's a powerful, uh, powerful statement. So what happened to you on your way to the studio? Well, I'll tell you, on uh, Friday, April 15th, um, at uh, uh, about 1.20 in the afternoon, uh, eight um, uh, uniformed and heavily armed members of the SBU, the um, Ukraine State Security Services, uh, appeared at my door. <laughs> they wanted to get in. And uh, beyond that, it is a, I am in Ukraine, as you know, I am in Kharkov. I am, of course, um, under the jurisdiction of the legal authority in Ukraine. And therefore, according to Ukraine law, I cannot discuss what happened once they had come in and taken me into custody. Uh, so I, I cannot, and I signed documentation to that, that avowed that I understood my obligation. And until this um, criminal process is complete, I cannot discuss it. 
uh, in, in any detail. Of course, just I understand. to... In, I understand. Yeah, just, just to make it clear, I understand I was never, uh, I, and I uh, wouldn't want you to get into any trouble. Uh, but more you, <laughs> you were never physically harmed. Uh, the important thing is that um, I'm not charged with uh, any kind of espionage or any kind of um, uh, 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 sedition or anything of the sort. Um, and we will see how this process moves forward. Now, um, I do believe that okay. the attention... Can you tell us about and, and Kharkov? Can you, can you tell us sure. what's happening uh, in Kharkov, which has now become the front line? Well, not quite. Um, the front line is really uh, closer to the Donbass, which is a couple of hundred, a couple of oh, about 150 kilometers from here. That's where the real action is happening, and it, it is a tragedy because the 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 West and and everybody and the mainstream media and the propagandists in the mainstream media are convincing everyone that the Ukrainians will win, that they will you know save the day and, and push out the Russians and invade Russia, take it over. These are dangerous. Don't touch your mic, Gonzalo. Can you hear me still? Yeah, sorry about that. Uh, for all their bravery, the, okay. um, the wonderful soldiers of uh, the Ukrainian armed forces, um, I, I want to make it clear, this is not a value judgment. This is a, a realistic assessment of the situation. For instance, if I were to step into the boxing ring with, say, Conor McGregor, um, I hope that I would win, of course, but realistically, I know that Conor McGregor would wipe the floor with me in about 10 seconds uh, because that's the reality of the situation. Okay, so this is not an issue of what I wish or hope for, but rather a realistic assessment. And the realistic assessment is that potentially thousands, if not tens of thousands, of wonderful, brave Ukrainian soldiers might perish needlessly because the political regime, the Zelensky regime, that are, is just the puppets of um, Victoria Newland and Anthony Blinken and that corrupt cabal in Washington, well, they are obliging him to continue a war that cannot be won. It is as simple as that. And it is a tragedy, it's, it's horrible, and I, I do not wish this to happen because I love Ukraine. I wouldn't be living here if I didn't like it. And I, can, I have the opportunity to live in any country in the world, and I like living in Ukraine. It's a wonderful country filled with wonderful people, decent, hardworking people, people who are always kind and always with a smile. But the reality of what has happened is the Zelensky regime goaded the Russians into this war, and they have discovered that the Russians were not kidding. They were not fooling around. And the things that have happened is that as this war has progressed, as the Russians have invested more and more energy, more men, more material, more psychological chips, it's clear that at the end of this, the, the Ukrainian nation will be torn asunder and the only thing that we can do at this point is to try to end this senseless war in order to save the lives of these brave young men, because no one would ever question their bravery, their valor. But like I said before in my analogy with uh, me stepping into the ring with Conor McGregor, you have to realize your limitations. You have to realize that sometimes guts, valor, bravery, they are simply not enough. And it is a tragic thing, but it has to be faced realistically like adults. And, and it, George, I can't tell you how much it breaks my heart to see these young men who are going to lose their lives and, and their babies. I mean, I'm a 54-year-old man. I, I, I don't want to ask, you know, how old you are, but I, I assume you're roughly my age. And, you know, you, you and I, we middle-aged men, we look at a boy of 20 and we see a boy, we see a child with his whole life ahead of him, a 20, 25-year-old boy, and yes, strong and energetic, but we see all of the life ahead of him and to see that wonderful promise be cut short 
for nothing except the ego of the Zelensky regime, the, the terror of the fascists, fascist thugs around him. And I say this knowing exactly what I'm speaking of. The, I'm not saying that they're like, oh, they're slightly right wing, therefore they're fascist. No, I'm talking about real neo-Nazis around the, the Zelensky who are puppeteering him. They are true fascists and they are terrified of the Russians with good reason because the Russians have said publicly that, you know, one, that they were, are going to get those guys. And so they are prolonging this war in order to save their hides like rats. And Victoria Newland in Washington, she wants to prolong this, you know, fight this war to the last Ukrainian because she and her whole corrupt cabal in Washington think that by prolonging this war, it hurts the Russians somehow. And it won't really, not really, because the Russians have this very firmly in hand. They are winning this war. And, and this is a hard reality that has to be faced. And in the West, nobody wants to face it. On the contrary, they keep on dreaming up some weird notions that they can achieve victory. There is no victory to be won. There will only be death and suffering of innocent people. And this is something that has to be prevented. And people have to you know, tell their um, elected representatives, tell people that there is nothing to be won at this point. It's over. And, and the tragedy is that the longer this goes on, the worse it will be for the innocent, for the young men who are fighting and who will lose their lives or be horribly maimed, for the civilians who will inadvertently be caught in the crossfire because this always happens in every war. It, it has to end as soon as possible. And, and that's my hope and, and prayer, quite frankly. Uh, because the, the, the situation... Well, very, it, uh, very, is, very powerful uh, soliloquy, Gonzalo, I must uh, say. Now, just before we leave you for now, and I hope we'll talk to you regularly, uh, if nothing I else, just to, to see how you are. Um, we, uh, we know that there have been some problems with your social media. Uh, so what is the exact place where we should follow you from this moment on. Well, thank you very much for asking. I, I, at this time, what happened was that the um, SBU investigators took my phone and they changed the passwords on all of my accounts. Uh, and so therefore I do not have access to my old YouTube channels or anything else, my Telegram channels, anything. The only thing I have at this time is Twitter. Twitter, it's Gonzalo Lira 1968 all one word, Gonzalo Lira 1968. And that's my official Twitter uh, handle. And uh, that's where I'm gonna be from now on. Do keep in mind that I, 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 you know, I'm, I'm back just two days ago. And so that's all I've been able to organize at this time. But uh, through that uh, uh, focus, that, uh, that point of, of entry, I will organize a new YouTube channel and start producing YouTube content and uh, get back up on my feet uh, because I, I want people to know what's going on. And also what's happened is that because of the situation, I've gotten a great deal of attention, which is incredibly flattering. But I think it would be worthwhile for me to use this attention to put the spotlight on a lot of different people who have a lot to contribute to the conversation, to people understanding the situation, not just in this issue of Ukraine, but also in the issue of the mismanagement of our civilization by our current leaders. We in the West, in Europe, Europe is going to go hungry by the end of this year. You know, George, that uh, I used to write financial blogs because I've been in finance. I, I grew up around finance. My my family is, has been in fin finance since forever. And so um, I know what has happened. The European Union, in trying to punish Russia, has shot itself not in the foot. They've shot themselves in the gut. And Europe is slowly bleeding out. And come September, there will be food shortages. I mean, forget about energy shortages. There are going to be rolling blackouts uh, by September. And this coming winter, the winter of 2022-2023, is going to be horrible in Europe. 
in what is supposed to be the richest continent on the face of the planet. And it's all because of the incredible mismanagement and the incredible vindictiveness of the European leadership towards Russia. And of course, if you kick somebody and you kick them and kick them and kick them, finally they're going to kick back. The Russians have kicked back and they have only even started when they decide finally by September to end the gas supply to Europe, which they will because the long-term contracts with uh, um, Gazprom are ending. They're starting to end, I do believe, in August and throughout the, end, the rest of the end of the year, the long-term contracts are, start, are going to start to end and the Russians will not sell any more gas to the Europeans. The Europeans keep threatening to sanction Russia and saying that, oh, we're not going to buy your gas anymore. The thing is, see, they don't seem to realize that, see, the, the gas is the, the, the uh, raw material that Europe needs because the Russians have other customers for their gas. They have the pipelines yeah. running to China and Southeast Asia. They don't need Europe. Europe needs Russia. And they're going to find out how much they need them when they go cold and hungry by the end of the year. And this is going to drag down the United States too. The American listeners who are listening to this, I'm here to tell you, this is not a European problem. This is a, a global West problem. This is Europe, the UK, Canada, America, uh, Australia, New Zealand, even parts of Central and South America are going to be hit by this. And it is going to be a disaster. And we are going to see migrations from Africa and the Middle East that are going to dwarf anything that happened in 2014 and 15. We are going to see tens of millions of people migrating from Africa, from the Middle East, because of food scarcity. You have to keep in mind something. Uh, Russia. Belarus, Ukraine, and Kazakhstan control 40% of the global wheat export market. 40%. And do keep in mind, in 2011, during the Arab Spring, which started off because of high food prices, why were there high food prices? Well, because Russia had a slightly bad harvest because of uh, inclement weather. It was slightly bad, and it caused the chaos of the Arab Spring. Imagine Ukraine, the breadbasket of Europe, one of the richest soils on the planet, one of the major uh, um, pr uh, providers of wheat in the global markets. It has postponed the, the, the planting. Roughly half the fields in Ukraine at this time have not been planted. So you're going to have at least half of the regular grain supply from Ukraine going to the rest of the world. How do you think that's going to affect the Middle East, Sub-Sahara Africa? It is going to be a disaster. And so I'm telling people now, get ready. And if you're smart, and I, I hate to sound like, um, you know, a chicken little, the sky is falling, but this time it really is falling. Uh, buy food now it is. while you can. It is. But yes. <laughs> buy food now. I'm taking that advice. Gonzalo Lira, stay safe and stay in touch. And everyone... Please follow Gonzalo Lira 1968. No other imposter, just Gonzalo Lira 1968. Let me go to the Midlands of England and talk with Anthony. Go ahead, Anthony. Good evening, George. Uh, nice to speak to you again. I know I only got a short time with you the last time I spoke with you. Uh, I'm concerned about the British government's attitude towards supporting these neo-Nazi uh, groups and that. Uh, I had two uncles killed by the Nazis during the war, and my mother was on the outskirts of Coventry when it was bombed uh, by the baskets, if you excuse the expression. I served uh, with the Royal Navy yeah. during the Falklands campaign. I've now dumped everything that I ever got from that campaign uh, in the dustbin because I'm not disgusted at the British government's attitude towards uh, supporting these these people. And I'm sure if I, I was, uh, please excuse my voice, I've got flu, uh, if I was 20 years younger, I'd pick up a gun and go and fight myself. Well, it is uh, inexcusable that a country which uh, for a time uh, stood alone 
I remind you of my sequel to Queensway. Uh, our country, for a time, stood alone against the Nazis. If we had not done so, uh, perhaps the war would have ended in 1941. And uh, Nazism and fascism would rule the roost still across the continents. That is a perfectly possible uh, hypothesis. And it is truly shameful uh, that we, the people who stood against fascism and Nazism and made an alliance with the then Soviet Union, now Russia, which did much more than anybody else to defeat that Nazism, should now be supporting Nazis against the Russians. Anthony, God bless you. The hour is late. I need to press on. Imran is in New Jersey. It's not that, Imran. Calm down. <laughs> Imran in New Jersey. Welcome. Hey, uh, Mr. Galloway. Thank you so much. How are you? Yes. This is Imran from New Jersey. Can you By the me? grace of God, good. Thanks. I I've can, been, Imran. Uh, Go ahead. Yeah, Great, great. Yeah, I mean, I've been on the line for some time, and uh, I, I found out, like, uh, PM Imran Khan is not joining, right? Is that correct tonight? Well, he, he's still he's got 25 to... minutes to do so, but it's not okay. it, It's not looking like it. Uh, okay. we, right. we booked him, uh, and the booking was confirmed, uh, but he's not here. I'm not blaming him, uh, but I'm definitely blaming his officials. But uh, never mind, it won't change my attitude, uh, Imran. Uh, you tell me what you think. You, no, you're right. I mean, we're not disappointed. Maybe, you know, we take a rain check and, uh, you know, join your show the next time, you know, when uh, all the stars are lined up. And uh, I just wanted to see, hear your thoughts, like, you know, where, uh, where Imran Khan's struggle stands at this point with his demand for the fresh elections, you know, do you see like um, the other side of the equation, which is, you know, the military establishment and the bureaucracy and, uh, you know, the Sharifs, you think like, you know, they're heeding, they're listening, they, you know, doing something to, to you know, move forward or you, you see a clash coming up like what we saw in Egypt, because I heard like you talked about Egypt and General Sisi, and you have a you know deep understanding of like how you know Pakistan has evolved in the last seventy years, and uh, you know he has a lot of support. So I just want to hear out your thoughts. Like, do you see like um, you know uh, the past? Well, it's uh, uh, a, a very good call. Uh, yeah, a, a very good call, Imran. Uh, I think they have miscalculated badly. They did not expect uh, the reaction to the imported government to be as fierce as it has been, and they underestimated the support that Imran Khan can mobilize in the country. And in the end, you know, a movement which can move millions and potentially tens of millions is not going to be stopped. Uh, because how do you stop it? You can't shoot it. Uh, you can't imprison it. Uh, it's unstoppable and unarrestable and unshootable. So even if there was a wish on their part to arrest this mass movement, they will not be able to do so. And the reason the mass movement is as broad and powerful as it is, as you've heard from several callers this evening, and as you can hear from me, because I never supported the PTI before. The demand is only for fresh elections. That's all. We're not asking for much. We're asking for the elections to be free and fair and now, so that the Pakistan people can pick their own government. Who's going to stand against that demand? In defense of the stinker, Shabazz Sharif? the stinkers in the cabinet. I don't think any self-respecting person, including in the army, will want to do that for long. Dr. J. Lennon says, greetings from Jamaica. I'm watching Moats TV and I've just heard the excellent interview with Caleb Mopan. 
Down here, we are feeling the effects of the Russia-Ukraine conflict. Prices are rising, but the effects would be so much less if our sellout parliamentarians weren't in the pockets of the West. The World Bank was instrumental in our transition from Venezuelan oil to U.S. natural gas. When a solar investment pays for itself within four years, and now we have the fourth highest electricity rates in the whole world in Jamaica. Since the IMF intervention in 2013, the local currency has depreciated almost 60%, and we've spent over 18 billion US dollars to reduce debt by around 7 billion. US dollars. Uh, that is amazing stuff from Jamaica. Uh, now, I've got too many to read right at this minute, but what I can tell you is that 2,000 people called the show tonight. In fact, more than 2,000 calls were received. And there's only my grandson and his partner on the switchboard. And my pal Dan, remotely doing what he can. 1,985 callers. Next week, we'll get through more of them. Now, last call, please donate. And you can make a recurring donation. So why don't you do this? Donate one pound now, and then press the recurring button. So you never have to think about it again. You've done your bit. One pound each per week, per show. Why don't you do that? Am I not worth it? Is all my efforts and the efforts of my friends not worth it? Let me take a break. You have to remember back in 2002, 2003, there was a wish by George Bush for regime change. That's what was driving him. Nothing to do with weapons of mass destruction, which of course didn't exist in Iraq. So they had to construct some sort of formula, some sort of cover story, in order to persuade the British public that intervention in Iraq was right. Now David Kelly, uh, as an expert in weapons of mass destruction, knew that uh, this was untrue. He knew that there were probably no weapons of mass destruction in Iraq. That was a guy that could have brought down, that was a guy that could have brought down the whole system. I reckon you're chaff. You've been thrown up to divert uh, our probing. The Foreign Affairs Select Committee, that um, parliamentarian briefing, I think that was an indignity to him. We saw it on the news, and my very first thought was shock. Um, oh my God, you know, this man is in the eye of the media hurricane. Uh, he should be protected by that at least. Of course, I know your hands, Prime Minister. Are you going to resign over this? I don't know the details of how Lord Hutton happened to be selected, but what was certainly the case is that he was the right kind of judge to use from the point of view of Downing Street and the intelligence services as well. Of the 21 days of hearing, only one half of one day was spent on discussing the forensic aspects. That is disgusting. We were given the Hutton report the day before it was published, but actually what happened was he went too far. The events of 2003 were disgraceful ones in this country's history, and it's unfinished business. Those responsible for an illegal war, those responsible for the death of David Kelly, have not been brought to justice. There's no, been no inquest into David Kelly's death. There needs to be one. We need to make sure that those who behaved in a reprehensible way in 2003 are finally brought to book. higher education with one of the world's best known iconoclasts the mother of all talk shows with george galloway if you haven't seen the film yet i'm pretty sure you'll like it if like is the appropriate word you'll certainly be chilled by it and you will begin to look differently perhaps at the state we are in uh, you can rent it on vimeo and you can buy it on Amazon or you can come to 
the film shows that I've had around the country and will continue to have. And there's still, I think, nine, there's eight tickets left for Oxford Town Hall tomorrow night. Don't leave me with eight empty seats. If you're anywhere near Oxford, get your tickets now. There's the uh, details on the screen. Now, Mark Seddon is a man who's been everything in my life. He's been my travel companion to Iraq, to Palestine. He was in the Labour Party with me. Uh, he was the editor of Tribune, uh, the Labour newspaper, which I strongly supported uh, during his editorship. He was a great campaigner against the Iraq war. He's a big supporter of all the right causes. Uh, but then he went off to be the United Nations media advisor and speechwriter to the president of the United Nations Security Council. I haven't seen him since he came back from there. Uh, maybe I'll ask him about the United Nations. But first, I want to ask him, can Boris Johnson survive? Mark Seddon, welcome uh, to the show. Uh, <clears throat> it's, it's looking dodgy for Boris Johnson, not for the, the rather flimsy uh, reason of a birthday cake and so on, but because, in the words of Mr. Macmillan, it's not one damn thing, it's one damn thing after another. Isn't that right? Yeah, well, it is. But, you know, as you were saying that, I was thinking, you know, the, the epithet uh, gate is, is attached to everything, so it's party gate, but we never have Iraq gate or Kelly gate. <laughs> it's, 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 it's attached to absolutely everything. So it, it almost minimises scandal in a way uh, and, uh, and misbehaviour and lying. And the thing, of course, about Boris Johnson, what we do know is that he just is a liar. I mean, Michael Howard had to f uh, sack him for being a liar. This is his, this is whole, his whole career has been built around lies. The public knows that he's a liar. Um, but, of course, at the last election, his main opponent, Jeremy Corbyn, was seen by much of the commentariat as an existential threat, whereas uh, Boris Johnson, well, here we are. It does look as though he's in uh, a kind of tailspin. But all those people who have written him off before, by the way, rather prematurely, uh, ignore the fact that uh, there doesn't really seem to be much else on offer for the Conservative Party behind him. Uh, and also that uh, despite everything, you know, the, the official opposition isn't really taking him down. And in fact, Boris Johnson's biggest threat is himself. Yes, uh, we'll come to Keir Starmer uh, in a minute, for it is he who is the leader of the opposition. We should remind uh, the audience, because many people will have forgotten that or not ever have known it. But one of the points you make there was to be my next question to you, because it is true that if not Boris Johnson, whom? Who in the Tory ranks is a credible prime minister? if Johnson were to fall? Well, I mean, you know, I'm just, I'm not a pundit, you know, I, but I read stuff and I look around and I, I look at the quality of public figures in, in high office. And like many people in this country, I kind of despair. Um, Liz Truss, Michael Gove, Rishi Sunak, the chancellor, he was, he was gonna be the, the shoe in. Uh, until a few weeks ago. Uh, I mean, what we do know is that you know, if Boris Johnson, if these local election results are as bad as many of the commentators are again saying, not, not borne out by national opinion polls, by the way, but let's see what happens. Well, you know, I, I imagine there'll be a bitter, uh, unpleasant struggle in the top of the Tory party as there usually is and they'll come up with somebody else but but who I don't know and I, I it's it, you, you struggle to identify somebody who has that election winning ability that Johnson has clearly got how what would constitute a bad result on the 5th of May Mark well I imagine I mean if, if there's extensive council losses right across the country and 
and a, a, a number of the members of parliament who got their seats at the last at the last election in traditional labor areas the so-called red wall seats if they start looking at their uh, local council results and see that their constituencies are going to be in in trouble uh, and they're going to have to, they're going to be struggling to hold on come the next election i i, I suppose it, it it builds up and of course as as we know in britain you know, once the story starts running, it doesn't stop. Uh, you know, it'll be we'll be back into this territory of letters of no competence being handed into the 1922 committee and all the rest of it. Um, but look, who knows uh, what we're seeing? Uh, I suppose out there, what I'm hearing is that there isn't a great deal of uh, response uh, on the doorstep. To uh, there's kind of almost a plague on all of your houses, and that's a pretty that's a pretty worrying thing for a parliamentary democracy. I would have thought, but you know, the national opinion polls show that the Labour Party is perhaps a couple of points ahead nationally. Um, well, I mean, we'll see what happens at a local level, uh, because it, as, as you know, George, better than anybody, you've been in Parliament many times, you know, it's what happens on the day. Yes. Now, uh, because of the hour, let me uh, truncate our conversation for this evening, at least and ask you about the bizarre statement made by uh, Sir Keith Starmer that uh, Jeremy Corbyn, only recently the leader of the party, with Keir Starmer sitting in his shadow cabinet and asking the country to vote for him as he needed to do in, in the election of 2017 and 29, that Jeremy Corbyn will never again be a Labour MP. Why? Because of his attack on NATO. When did it become a part of the Labour Party's rules that you had to love NATO? Well, you don't have to love NATO or love the bomb or do any of that. I mean, Jeremy Corbyn, many people may disagree with him in the Labour Party, but he comes from a fine old tradition that um, Michael Foote would have recognised. I mean, Michael Foote would have disagreed with him on certain things, of course, because Michael Foote was in favour of uh, sending a task force to the Falkland Islands. But no, I mean, the thing about all of this is that it's, I suppose that, it probably no longer bothers Jeremy Corbyn that much that he may not be able to stand as a Labour candidate because he'll stand and win only, uh, anyway, I, I guess, as an independent. But it's, I think what it demonstrates more than anything else is that uh, Sir Keir Starmer, who, 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 who ran clearly under an entirely false prospectus um, because he's disavowed everything that he stood on. I mean, it's quite extraordinary. You talk about Boris Johnson being a liar, and of course, Johnson's lies are really rather more serious. But the thing is that Starmer's ran on entirely false prospectus on a, on a program that his predecessor was running on. He supported Jeremy Corbyn, and now it's really rather petty. Uh, he won't let him back in under any circumstance. Look, I mean, the, the, the thing is, for an awful lot of youngsters out there, whether the commentariat likes it or not, I mean, Corbyn represented um, hope to a lot of them. And um, they don't really like the way he's been treated. And, of course, that transfers into the fact that lots of people have now left the Labour Party and won't go and work for it. So it's kind of completely self-defeating. If he was a bigger person, a real leader, Sakir, he would welcome this guy back. What's the, what's the problem, really? Mark Seddon, as always, illuminating, coruscating even. Thank you for joining us on the mother <laughs> of you. all Thank talk you. shows. Let's get a couple of calls in. Ash is in Japan. We always like to visit Japan on the mother of all talk shows. Go ahead, Ash. Oh, thanks for having me, George. Um, my question is, of course, reg regarding the war in the Ukraine. Um, of course, there have been so many empires before. And I think of course, we all can acknowledge that American empire is about to end. I'm a little, I'm, I mean, I'm, I hope that it kind of does because of all the damage it's done, but I also worry, um, can we expect that eventually the ones that rise up afterwards will just simply follow the same trend and eventually become cruel or greedy or just simply out of control? Or is, is this current empire, I want to say an exception, but I don't think it's an exception, but can we expect a better treatment for the world from a multipolarized world where China and Russia have more um, of, a, of a well, say in what happens? That or is, is the it point, basically... Ash. Uh, I'm not, yeah, 
Look, I'm not trying to bring down the American empire in order that another empire takes its place. I'm against all empires. Uh, my children, I was driving around the other day, we looked at some walls that were built by the Roman Empire. And uh, of course, they made good roads and good walls, the better to conquer us and govern us. Uh, and the Roman Empire came to an end, as all empires must. But the task is to replace the American Empire, not with another empire but with a multipolar world around the United Nations constituted a democratically uh, with votes according to the weight of population uh, with some weighting in there. A Security Council elected by the General Assembly of the United Nations. Uh, a new uh, multipolar world where Europe has its place not as a satrapy of the United States, but in accordance with its economic and cultural weight in the world. Uh, one where, uh, where the countries currently on the periphery are on the inside, and one where the countries, based on the weapons they had in the 1940s, uh, no longer have the right uh, merely to veto. Uh, events in the world. That's what we need to move to. Ash in Japan, thanks for the call. There's a legend on the line. In fact, there's two legends on the line. Let's take the capital the legend first. It's Norma in Bristol. Norma, welcome. Hello, George. Um, I just wanted to say that um, uh, it's about Finland and Sweden might join NATO. Now, I heard that in next week's parliament in Finland, they are voting to apply to join NATO, and Sweden might follow suit. Now, this is worrying, isn't it? Because if NATO's going to get larger, and if they surround Russia, Russia's going to feel suffocated. And I, I mean, I have no love for Russia or the leaders in Ukraine, but when people feel isolated, they always fight back harder, don't they? And I think it's a bit of a worry because you've got to be so careful that it doesn't escalate, you know, before it's too late, really. What do you think to that? Norma, I spoke uh, on my Wednesday show at some length about Finland. Uh, I won't repeat that now. I'll just ask people to look back on YouTube at uh, Galloway Show 4. Uh, Sweden has never been neutral. It wasn't neutral when it was in league with Hitler while claiming to be uh, neutral during the Second World War. And it isn't neutral now. Uh, and never should have uh, been regarded as such. It is part of the American empire. And if it formalizes that by joining uh, NATO, uh, I frankly don't think it adds up to a row of beans. Finland is a different kettle of fish. I earnestly hope that Finland will turn back from the course that they have set themselves because, as I pointed out on Wednesday, you could actually throw a stone from Finland and it would land in the streets of St. Petersburg, the second greatest city in Russia. Uh, it's 200 miles from the Ukrainian border uh, to Moscow. Uh, but it's not, it's barely 200 yards from the Finnish border to St. Petersburg. And therefore, Finnish membership of NATO, with its accompanying stationing of American forces and weapons, a stone's throw from St. Petersburg or Leningrad, as some of us prefer to call it, is a non-starter. It will be a casus belli, and if it happens, it will have exactly the same trajectory as the situation in Ukraine has. God bless you, Norma. You and your husband, you are much cherished by the audience of the mother of all talk shows. Let's uh, go to uh, Kenny in Acton. Go ahead, Kenny. Hi, George. I was just listening to uh, what people have been saying about 
Vladimir Putin saying that Ukraine needs to be denazified. Now, Zelensky secured 73% of the vote in 2019, and he's a Jew. And every country in Europe has far-right neo-Nazi elements. It's no unique to Ukraine. In fact, the far-right in Russia have more political power and political sway than they do in Ukraine. So Vladimir Putin's claim that Ukraine needs to be denazified. The, the statistics, it doesn't add up. What have you got to say about that? Right? <clears throat> yeah, yeah. I just wait to hear what uh, your well, thoughts are. Well, what I've got to say is going to blow you away. But what okay. is obvious is that you weren't listening to what I said uh, earlier. I told you the story. I'm, I'm, I'm just going to say one word. Einsatzgruppen. I'm going to say go to Netflix and watch what happened in Western Ukraine and watch how the millions were massacred by Nazis in the west of Ukraine. Zelensky's country is infested with Nazi ideology. Western Ukraine has always had it. As I said at length earlier in the show, perhaps you're only just in and didn't catch it. Zelensky has made a peace with people who actually wave Nazi flags on their demonstrations. Tattoo SS insignia on their skin and are a part, an entire regiment of the Ukrainian army. There are no Nazi regiments in any other army in the world except the Ukrainian army. And then there's the right sector regiment. Then there's the Svoboda. Then there's one after the other after the other, an alphabet soup of extreme nationalism and fascism in Ukraine. I'm really sorry, Kenny, that a man like you parrots these mass media imperialist sheep-like brays. These are talking points of those who wish to herd you. And clearly, you're a sheep that has been herded. The poll is closed. 6,900 people voted. Will Prime Minister Boris Johnson be out before May is out? A, yes, 48%. No, 52% on Twitter. Boris is going to survive. Uh, on my uh, YouTube, though, it's yes, 59, no, 41. And on Telegram, it's yes, 57, no, 43. So um, if I were you, Boris, I'd just look at the Twitter part of that poll. Please, you can still donate and make it a recurring donation to the mother of all talk shows. Please do it as soon as the program is over. And there's the details on the screen. It's really simple. And it's even simpler if you vote to recur. You can check out our website. And, uh, of course, uh, assuming we can pay for it, I'll see you next week at the same time and the same place for the mother of all talk shows. But on Wednesday, I'll be on YouTube exclusively the Galloway show it's me stripped back raw unleashed you thought I was fierce tonight where do you see me on a Wednesday Pakistan Zindabad Imran Khan Zindabad